Um, we need some. Are you get, is he getting the earphones? Okay. Calling is uh, D one zero one CR twenty twenty three forty State of New Mexico versus Hannah Gutierrez. Party state your name. Terry Morrissey and Jason Lewis on behalf of the State of New Mexico. Mr. Lewis has stepped out. Got a good morning, Jason Bowles, and Monica Barreras, Carmela Cisneros, so here with Ms. Gutierrez Reed. All right, thank you. All right, is this your next witness? This is. All right. Good. The state calls Bryce Ziegler. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Mr. Zick, oh. Is your microphone on? Yes. Okay. Mr. Ziegler, uh, go ahead and just state your full name for the record. My name is Bryce Ziegler, first name spelled B-R-Y-C-E, last name spelled Z-I-E-G-L-E-R. Mr. Ziegler, how are you currently employed? I'm currently employed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation within the Laboratory Division, specifically within the Firearms and Tool Marks Unit. Can you give the jury a summary of your educational background and training? I received a Bachelor's of Science in Forensic Science from the Pennsylvania State University. And how long have you worked for the FBI? Since the summer of 2011. And since 2011, uh, what positions have you held at the FBI? I was initially hired into one of the DNA units at the laboratory and I essentially worked as what's called a technician in that discipline. So I essentially did uh, the majority of the DNA processing operations, but then a examiner would come in, review my work, review the profiles, and take it from there. Um, in 2015, I transferred to the Firearms Tool Marks Unit, which is where I am now, and I was also promoted to a forensic examiner. So in this current position, um, I receive evidence that's related to my discipline. I perform the requested examinations on those items of evidence, and I issue the results in a formal laboratory report. And also, if I'm called to, I can testify to those results. And, sir, other than, uh, uh, other than your undergraduate degree, what kind of training do you have in the area of firearms and tool marks? In order to become a qualified forensic examiner in this discipline, I had to complete what's called the Forensic Examiner Training Program. And that program, it's developed and implemented by the FBI lab, and it's specific to each particular unit. So I had to complete the program specific for firearms and tool marks. And this program, so I was assigned a mentor, and I was also given a training manual. So this mentor kind of guided me through the process, reviewed tasks in that training manual with me, and to essentially complete that process, I had to pass a series of written examinations, oral board exercises, practical competency tests, as well as moot court exercises. Um, <clears throat> thank you, sir. And have you ever been qualified as an expert? In court. In court, yes. Yes, I have. Um, and in what areas have you been qualified as an expert? Some of those are general firearms examinations. Um, sometimes it's firearms identification, so that's the microscopic comparison of fired ammunition components back to firearms. I've also been qualified in shooting incident reconstruction. And in terms of shooting incident reconstruction, did you do that kind of work um, in this case? No, I did not. Uh, and I apologize, we were having a, a, a technical difficulty here. 
Um, in terms of the work that you did on this case, um, what what areas of expertise have you been qualified as an expert in that apply to this case? Sure, the, I would say those two areas are the examination of firearms and also firearms identification. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, we will ask the court to recognize, well, you know what, let, let, let me pause. Um, have, you, have you testified before? Yes, I have. A and have you been qualified as an expert in other courts? Yes, I have. Um, and how many other courts have qualified you as an expert? 13. And are those all federal courts or state courts? Ten of those are federal, three were state. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would ask the court to recognize uh, Mr. Ziegler as an expert in firearms examination and firearms... Identification. Thank you, identification. All right, you are recognized as an expert in examination of firearms and firearm identification. Now, in... It's okay, thanks, you can have a seat. Uh, in this particular case, uh, were you provided certain items of evidence for testing? Yes, I was. Uh, and approximately how many items of evidence were you provided for testing? That's difficult to approximate um, because I was given a certain number of item numbers, but those item numbers may have, for example, 30 cartridges. So. Um, I believe that item numbers, I would say maybe around uh, 50 items, but again, that could uh, mean a much larger set of items. In, were you provided a firearm to examine in this case? Yes, I was. And did you have any understanding where that firearm came from? Um, I don't have personal knowledge of where the items of evidence are submitted from. They are generally submitted uh, with some information that gets populated into our laboratory database. So I do have a description of that. That information gets populated into my lab report, but I don't have direct knowledge of where those items came from. So what was your understanding, and I appreciate your qualification there, what was your understanding of where the firearm in this case came from that you uh, administered some testing on? So in this case, it was just labeled as a revolver. Um, there was no description as to, for example, no address where that firearm was collected from. You weren't given any information about whether it was uh, collected from a movie set or whether it was uh, a prop being used by an actor? Your Honor, I'm going to object to leading. Uh, actually, I don't think that is leading. Overruled. I don't have that information. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you, whoops, what I have marked as States Exhibit 97. May I approach? Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. Um, what is that? May, we, may I see that? Mr. Ziegler, what, what, what did I just show you? That is a photograph of the revolver that was submitted to my laboratory for examination. Is this a revolver that you did testing on? Yes, it is. Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to move for the admission of State's Exhibit 97 and ask for permission to publish. No objection. All right, State's 97 is admitted. You may publish. It was on my screen before. And can I ask, is there any, is there any way for me to only publish to that monitor so that I don't have to walk back and forth? Just to his monitor so that it only goes to his and doesn't go to everybody else's when I'm going through the exhibits. No, it's, if it's published, well. Uh, you mean to recognize it? Correct. Um, we would have to keep turning it on and off. Okay. Or else you could, um, yeah, that's what we'd have to do. Okay. 
Uh, why don't we just take a, a, a minute and let me see if I can get an agreement so that we don't have to do that. Okay. All right. Great. The state will move for the uh, admission and uh, permission to publish throughout Mr. Ziegler's testimony of State's Exhibit 97, 97A, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110. So is it 97A through 110? Did you skip anything? 97, 97A, and then 98 through 110. Any objection? All right. States 97 through 110 are admitted. Every time we unplug it. All right, Mr. Ziegler, um, can we go ahead and put it up on the screen? Yes. Mr. Ziegler, tell us a little bit about this firearm that was provided to you. What kind of a gun is it? And just generally speaking, how does a gun like this operate? So this is an image, a photograph of the revolver that was submitted and this is a single action revolver so that means that the hammer must be manually cocked by the shooter every time that the shooter intends to fire so some revolvers if you pull the trigger it will do the work of cocking the hammer for you and releasing the hammer this type of firearm does not have that ability the shooter must physically cock the hammer each time um, is this a touch screen by chance? Yes. Okay. so to point out a few key areas of this firearm the portion on the left, don't believe him. He's going to come help you. Okay. Thank you. So the portion on the left in this photograph is the barrel. Towards the center, we have the cylinder. This back portion here is the hammer. We have the trigger near the bottom. And this wooden piece is the grip. So this is where you would hold the firearm. Let me clear this out. So basically, in order to get this firearm to function, you would have to load cartridges into the cylinder. This can be accomplished two ways. You can't see it in this photograph, but on the opposite side is what's called a loading gate. You can open, and you then have access to the cylinder. So you can load each cartridge one at a time rotating the cylinder until you have as many cartridges as you desire. You could also remove this pin here, remove the cylinder from the firearm, and load it that way. But regardless, when, once you load the cylinder, you must manually cock the hammer all the way to the rear, and then at this point, this firearm will be ready to fire. So a pull of the trigger would release the firearm, or excuse me, the hammer. The hammer has a firing pin that's fixed to the hammer, so as the hammer falls, the firing pin would strike the primer of the cartridge and fire that cartridge. Can you give us a, a quick description about the notches on the hammer and the different hammer positions? Yes, so as you would cock this hammer, 
It has several safety notches by design. So as you cock it, you're going to hear a series of clicks, and those are the safety notches. So as you start to cock it, you're going to hear your first click. That's the quarter cock notch. If you continue to cock it, you'll hear your second click. That's the half cock notch. And if you cock it all the way, you'll hear the third click, and that's when it's in its fully cocked position. So those intermediate two cocking positions, they serve to do two things. Number one, when the hammer is completely at rest or not cocked at all, the firing pin actually protrudes inside the frame. So it's very difficult to see here, but in between this gap, between the cylinder and the frame, you would actually be able to see the firing pin sticking out. So as you start to cock it, it starts to remove the firing pin from protruding. So we don't want the firing pin making contact with the cartridges when we don't want it to. So it starts to retract the firing pin, and also, if I'm cocking the hammer and my thumb slips off the hammer, you would expect that it's going to catch in one of those two safety notches. So this is to prevent the hammer from falling unless you want it to. So really, this firearm is only designed to fire when the hammer is in its fully cocked position. In terms of the, well, let me ask you this, the, the, the half cock notch, so that's going to be the second click that you hear when you're cocking the hammer, is that correct? Correct. Um, is there anything particular about the half cock position other than it being a safety? Um, can you elaborate? Sure. How, uh, what position does the hammer have to be in in order to load this gun with ammunition? I understand. So you have to have the hammer retracted to a certain point to allow the cylinder to rotate freely. So there's a part, and it's on the inside here, called the cylinder stop, and that cylinder stop does not unlock until the hammer is pulled back to a certain point. So once it's pulled back to a certain degree, you can freely rotate the cylinder to load it with as many cartridges as you desire. So in order to load and unload this gun, if you don't remove the pin and remove the cylinder, you, it has to be in the half cock position. I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's somewhere between the quarter and the half cock, but it is in that intermediate area, yes. So once you get it into the half cock position, uh, what do you have to do to load it? So I'll clear this out. Again, on the other side, there's a loading gate that you can open and you then have access to the uh, cylinder. So you can load it that way or remove the cylinder itself. How many cylinder positions do you have access to uh, when you open that loading gate? Only one at a time, so you must manually rotate the cylinder and continue to load a single cartridge at a time. So for those of us that are familiar with revolvers where you push a button and the entire cylinder kind of rolls out and you can load and unload that way, does this gun work that way? No, those are going to be your more modern style revolvers. Um, it, if you noticed when you received this gun and you examined this gun, did this gun appear to be very old or relatively new or were you not able to tell? Uh, I'm not able to tell its age now. Okay. Um, who is the manufacturer of this revolver? It's, the trade name is Pieta. It's an Italian company. And do you know anything about Pieta and what they do, what they make? Um, I do know they have product lines that are, they create new firearms that are essentially replicas of older firearms. Is this a replica? It, it's a replica in that it's an old design, um, but it's still a functioning firearm. Now, if the hammer, let, let, let's talk about kind of hypothetically, let's assume that this gun is fully loaded with live ammunition and we have the hammer in its resting position so it's fully down. Do, is that the position it's in in this photo? Yes, it appears so. So, how is this gun designed in terms of safety uh, with regard to possible 
accidental discharges when the hammer is in the fully, fully rested position. Right, so when the hammer is fully forward, as I mentioned earlier, the firing pin actually protrudes inside the frame. So if you have the cylinder fully loaded and the hammer is at rest on a chamber that has a live cartridge in it, that firing pin is actually sitting on the primer of that cartridge. So if I were either to strike the hammer or if I were to drop it and it landed on the hammer, it's going to fire that cartridge. So if you hit the hammer with enough force, it will detonate that primer in that position. And that's, that's part of the design of this firearm. That's just how these are made. And if you were to look at the owner's manual, which this is one thing I did as part of my exam, uh, you would actually see warnings not to carry this firearm with the hammer at rest on a loaded chamber. So a lot of times it's actually advised that you, you load one less cartridge in the cylinder, so you have one empty chamber, and that's how it's carried with the hammer forward on that chamber. So these are recommendations in the owner's manual. So this isn't some phenomenon, this is something that's known about the design of these firearms. And what kind of testing did you perform on this firearm? So initially I did a function evaluation just to make sure it appeared that you know there weren't any uh, odd modifications, that it was functioning correctly. Um, after that I was requested to do some microscopic comparisons as I was also submitted a fired bullet and a fired cartridge case. And then the last type of testing I did on this particular gun is what's called accidental discharge testing. So essentially the, the goal of that test is to see if I can get this firearm to function without pulling the trigger. So the, the first set of testing that, that you mentioned, what did that entail? So function examination is basically I need to inspect the firearm for safety purposes. Uh, keep in mind I've never seen this firearm before when I first opened the box. So I don't know what condition it's been in, I don't know how old it is, I don't know how well it's been taken care of. So eventually I'm going to want to test fire that gun, so I need to make sure I feel that it's safe to fire, so I don't have some catastrophic failure while I do so. Um, once I determine that it is safe to fire, I will physically take the gun to one of two locations in the FBI lab, and I will load it with ammunition from the laboratory and actually test fire the gun. And did you test fire this gun? Yes, I did. Approximately how many rounds of ammunition did you fire out of this gun? Uh, may I refer to my report? Sure. I physically fired this gun 12 times, so I, as a result of that, I retained the fired bullet and fired cartridge cases that I produced during that test firing. And I also collected some other cartridge cases as a product of the testing that I did. So these would be uh, cartridge cases that I collected during the accidental discharge testing. And the rounds that you fired, the 12 rounds that you fired out of this gun, uh, were they evidence rounds or were those rounds that were supplied by the FBI? They were FBI cartridges and then once I fire them in the evidence firearm, they become what's called secondary evidence and essentially if I have to uh, conduct microscopic comparisons at a later point, the, that secondary evidence, they now become my knowns. I know they came from that firearm because I physically shot it and collected those items. All right, thank you. <clears throat> um, tell us about the second uh, group of testing that you did. Right, that was the microscopic comparisons. So again, I was submitted a fired bullet and a fired cartridge case. And essentially I was asked to determine if, in my opinion, I could determine if those two items were fired by this particular revolver. Okay, and let me back you up for, for a moment. Uh, did you examine rounds of ammunition as a part of your uh, forensic examination in this case? Yes, I did. And did you examine dummy rounds? Yes, I did. Did you examine live rounds? Yes. Did you examine live rounds? <clears throat> well, 
Did you examine live rounds that you understood to be provided by someone named Seth Kenny? Yes, there were some cartridges that were submitted and they were declared to be live rounds um, as they were submitted. Did you examine live ammunition that came from a location that you were notified was 126 Monroe Street? Your Honor, I don't object to leading. I, I, I'm not leading, I'm just asking him a direct question. Over and over. Uh, may I review my Sure. Thank you. Yes, I do have some uh, item numbers that have that address in their item description. Did you also examine live ammunition that came from the set of the movie Rust? Yes, I did. And when you examined that ammunition, what did that entail? So the evaluation of the ammunition uh, kind of took place in a couple different phases. So first, I just looked at the physical characteristics. So I evaluated its appearance from the outside. And based on that, I started to segregate these types of ammunition into groups just based on their physical appearance. So I could put them into groups. For example, some of them appeared to be live cartridges. So I had that group. Some of them appeared to be dummy rounds. And so they, might, they may have some physical a visual clue that they may be a dummy. So for instance, some of them had holes drilled into the side of them. So I could look into the cartridge and see there was no powder present. Um, some of them, when you shake them, there are actual BBs inside. So that produces an audible indicator that even though this looks to be a live cartridge, in reality, there's nothing on the inside. So I can shake it, and that's another indicator that that may be a dummy. Um, there were a series of blanks, which a blank does not have a bullet. It still has a primer and gas, but it's not meant to actually fire a projectile. Um, so I started to form these groups just based on their physical characteristics. I then x-rayed all the ammunition because I could hear some of these cartridges had, it sounded like BBs inside when you shook them. So I wanted to get an idea of just a picture of what was going on inside these cartridges. So again, I took those two pieces of information, sorted them into groups, and then eventually I worked with the contributor to determine which of these cartridges actually need to be disassembled. So we can take out the bullet and we can look inside and see is there any powder present? Does it look like the primer is active or not? So those were kind of the three phases to sort of determine which categories these cartridges actually fell into. Okay, and quickly, I'm going to jump you to the accidental discharge testing that you did. Uh, can you summarize for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what that accidental discharge testing consisted of and why you did that testing? All right, so again, uh, accidental discharge, its goal is essentially to determine, can I fire this firearm without pulling the trigger? That's, that's kind of the end goal. And the way we do that is... The test is designed to simulate the firearm being bumped or banged into something, just being jostled around, um, and seeing can those kind of interactions fire the firearm. So the way we replicate this in the laboratory is I will take the gun and actually strike it with a rawhide mallet on six planes. So if you picture, picture a box sitting in front of you, the six planes would be the front of the box, the rear of the box, the left side, the right side, the top, and the bottom. So those are the six planes. So if you kind of picture the revolver and picture how those six planes work around that gun, I'm going to go around and strike the firearm in all six of those planes with a rawhide mallet. Again, trying to determine if it will actually fire without me touching the trigger. And specifically when you're striking the firearm, are you striking the hammer? That was a part of the testing that I did, yes. Prior to conducting that testing, um, did you have any thoughts about whether that could potentially result in damage to the gun? 
Right, so this is actually in our standard operating procedures that this type of testing is potentially destructive to the firearm. Um, so just kind of generally speaking, if I'm going to do an exam that may destroy or alter the evidence permanently, I would seek out the contributor's permission to do that exam before I actually go and do it. So that, that is what was done in this case. Uh, so you obtained permission to proceed with that testing? That's correct. Understanding that it could result in damage? Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and, uh, well, let's go ahead and just briefly describe uh, the, the striking of the mallet and whether or not uh, at some point there was damage and, and kind of what you learned during that test. Um, so as we're doing this test, uh, we want to test the firearm in all modes of fire that it's capable of. So if I, if I have a rifle, for instance, and say it's semi-automatic and fully automatic, I would do the test in both of those settings. Um, in this case, completely different type of firearm, um, but I wanted to test this gun in all four positions of the hammer. So at rest, quarter cock, half cock, and fully cocked. Um, and essentially as a result of that testing, there were only two times that I was able to get this firearm to fire. The first one being when the hammer was at rest on a loaded chamber. So as I previously described to you, the firing pin was sitting directly on the primer. So when I struck the hammer with the mallet, that provided enough force to detonate the primer. So again, that's a known uh, feature of this type of firearm. The second test where this occurred was when the hammer was in the fully cocked position and I was uh, doing my striking in the six planes as I described and eventually I got to the rear of the firearm so that that back plane and eventually at some point I struck the hammer with a rawhide mallet and the hammer actually fell and it detonated the primer. So what happened was some of the internal components of the firearm actually broke to allow that hammer to fall and fire the, the primed cartridge case. So I previously mentioned those quarter and half cock notches. If the hammer were to fall and there was no damage inside the gun, I would expect that the, the, the portion that makes contact with the hammer is called the sear. That sear should have been caught either by the quarter or the half cock notch as the hammer was falling. It should not have been able to fall all the way. So this is what led me to believe that there was some type of damage that occurred within the gun. And eventually I disassembled it to figure out exactly what that damage was. So the damage that you discovered, um, just so we're clear, was that damage sustained at the FBI lab? Yes, it was. Based on the testing that you did, when this gun was received by the FBI, was it in proper working order? Yes, so the, the first exam I did was the function exam. So again, that's making sure it's operating correctly um, and that it hasn't been modified. During that test, I also examined the safeties. So as it was received in that condition, when I went through the function evaluation, everything appeared to be operating correctly. So it functioned normally as it was designed. So you were able to make it fire in the resting position, correct? That's correct. And then did you put it in the quarter cock position? Yes. And did you strike it with a mallet? In that particular case, for the quarter as well as the half cock, I did not need to do the mallet testing. What kind of testing did you do? So the quarter and half cock notches are not designed to essentially lock the trigger, put your firearm completely in a safe uh, setting. So again, they're designed that if your finger slips off the hammer, it's going to catch it. So in this type of gun, if your hammer is in either the quarter or the half cock, you can actually squeeze the trigger and if you squeeze it hard enough, it's going to cock the hammer enough that it releases. So you can still make the hammer fall even though it's in these two intermediate safety positions if you apply sufficient pressure to the trigger. So I did a variety of testing to determine if I put the hammer in the quarter cock as well as the half cock notch and I squeeze the trigger hard enough 
that I allow the hammer to fall, is it even feasible for the hammer to detonate the cartridge? And I determined in both of those positions it was not. And we understand that the next uh, testing that you did was in the full cock position. That's correct. And ultimately, um, as you predicted, uh, was the gun damaged? As a result of the testing, yes, it was damaged. Okay. Let's move to States Exhibit 97A. Uh, can you tell us what we're looking at here? Yes, yeah, so this is a photograph that I took after the accidental discharge testing was complete. So on the right hand side, we have the hammer. As I mentioned before, the firing pin is fixed to the hammer, so that's that uh, piece that you see protruding from the hammer. In the top left, this piece is called the cylinder stop. So you can see a piece of that component fractured off. The bottom left here we have the trigger and this tiny piece here is what actually fractured off the trigger. Now as I mentioned before, uh, I explained the quarter and half cock notches, so I'm actually going to point those out to you. On the hammer, these kind of jagged edges, the first one is the quarter cock notch. So as you're cocking the hammer, you hear that first click. That is the, the sear portion of the trigger, which is now broken, locking into that little recess. Your second click is the half cock notch, so that's that second jagged edge. And then your last click is the actual sear notch. So that's where the trigger is sitting when the hammer is in its fully cocked position. So when I struck the hammer with the mallet, it actually broke off that piece of the trigger that was sitting up against the hammer there. And is there anything unusual to you in this photo about the full cock notch on the hammer? Uh, so again, this, this uh, notch here is the full cock notch. Um, so you may notice when looking at this that this notch appears much flatter when you compare it to the other two notches. Um, so it could be that a, a small portion of this surface was also damaged. Uh, during the testing, but in addition to that, there are times where the sear notch is just not as pronounced as the other two notches. So, I didn't observe any damage myself in this particular area, but it's it's possible that that area was damaged as well. And based on your testing, did you form an opinion about whether or not this gun could be fired without the handler pulling the trigger? So again, the only two times that occurred was with the hammer at rest on a loaded chamber, and the second time I attributed this to the breakage of internal components. So again, if, if these parts had not broken, I would expect that the trigger should have been caught by either the quarter or the half cock notch as the hammer was coming forward. So I would not expect this to occur had this breakage not happened. So just to be clear, did you form an opinion about whether the handler uh, would have to pull the trigger of the gun to make the gun fire? My opinion is that the only reason this occurred is because of the breakage. So in order to move the trigger away from the hammer, that's typically accomplished by pulling the trigger. So in this case, the only way that was possible is because the trigger actually fractured. Okay, so in order for you, just so that we're clear, in order for you to make the gun fire without pulling the trigger, when it was in the full cock position, you had to break it. That's, that's what I had to do in my lab. Um, I can't account for all the other possibilities that may have existed in you know, some hypothetical scenario, but this is the result as I tested it in my laboratory. It would not fire without pulling the trigger in the full cock setting without being broken. Thank you. Uh, let's move to States Exhibit 98. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? Yes, this is a photograph of the fired bullet that was submitted for comparison. And 
Can you describe to us in a little bit more detail what we're seeing in this photo? Um, this is a this is the lead bullet that was submitted. Um, it's very damaged. So typically, when I look at a fired bullet, I would expect to see nice areas that are engraved with the negative impression of the barrel. So I'd expect to see. <coughs> For example, deep lines that define what we call the rifling. And in this case, I don't see that. I just see a series of abrasions on the outside of this bullet. So essentially, whatever this bullet came into contact with, it basically damaged the exterior surface so greatly that the information that was left behind from the barrel is gone. When you're talking about what the bullet came in contact with. I just want to be clear, are you talking about what the bullet came in contact with after it left the barrel of the gun? That's correct. States Exhibit 99, explain to us what we're looking at here. Um, so these are just additional images of the same fired bullet. So I took these using my microscope, so they're uh, a little bit higher magnification. Um, and basically, in both of these photos, the bullet is pointing to the left. So you're looking at uh, the image of the left, you're looking at all of the damage and abrasions that were present on that bullet when I received it. And the image on the right is similar to the one you saw on the previous slide, where it, it doesn't have the deep gouges in different directions, but the rifling is still virtually gone from this bullet. Can you tell us what caliber this bullet is? When we receive fired bullets, uh, the only way we can estimate the caliber is based on the diameter, so I can measure the diameter of the bullet, and also the bullet weight. So for those two items, they were very close between a 44 caliber and a 45 caliber bullet. So I classified it as either a 44 or 45 caliber bullet. Can you explain to us um, why a 45 caliber bullet, by the time it gets to you, may have a different uh, diameter and weight? Sure. So this projectile is lead, which is a relatively soft material. Most modern bullets are going to have a harder jacketing material, so it's going to have a lead core with a harder jacket around it. The most common type is going to be copper, and that harder material is going to protect the lead core. It's going to help it keep its mass as it starts hitting things. But because this is lead, it's relatively soft, it's, very, it's much more susceptible to damage when it hits things. So it's possible that when I receive a bullet or even a bullet fragment, and I go to take a measurement of that bullet, it may be less than the true measurement because it's hit things and I, I now only have a partial bullet. Or conversely, it, it could actually be a wider diameter because it hits something and it flattens, so that causes it to expand. So that's why when I'm taking that measurement into consideration, I may not be able to narrow it down to just one specific caliber. And States Exhibit 100, what's this? These are two images of the fired cartridge case that was submitted for the examination. So the left image is uh, from the side, and the right image you're looking at what's called the head stamp of the cartridge. So the head stamp itself is the outer ring where you're going to see information such as the caliber, so 45 Colt is the caliber. Uh, you may also see symbols which relate to the manufacturer. And then this silver colored surface in the center here is the primer that I've been talking about. So this is what the firing pin comes into contact with when you pull the trigger. So this crater in the center, that's the firing pin impression. So when the firing pin pull, uh, falls, strikes the primer, it leaves behind an impression of the firing pin. And also during the firing pin, uh, excuse me, the firing process, the cartridge case rests up against a flat surface called the breech face. 
And during the firing process, this cartridge case slams into the breech face and it can pick up an impression of imperfections on that surface. So you may see some parallel lines. Some of these lines are kind of arcing. They almost appear to be crosshatch. Again, there's more parallel lines on the left here. That's an impression that this cartridge case has picked up from the breech face of the firearm. Did you compare this casing with anything else, any other casings? Um, this was the only fired cartridge case that was submitted, but I did compare it to those known specimens that I collected from the revolver that was submitted. And the known specimens, are those the ones that you fired out of the revolver yourself? That's correct. That's the secondary evidence that I spoke about earlier. So I created that evidence in the lab by physically test firing the gun and they became my knowns at that point. Did you form an opinion about whether or not this cartridge casing was fired from the gun that we saw in the earlier exhibits? Yes, it's my opinion that I identified this cartridge case as having been fired by the revolver. States Exhibit 101, what are we looking at here? So these are representative images of the comparison that I did to get to that conclusion of identification. So if you look at the image on the left, this is two cartridge cases being compared side by side. And this is on my what's called comparison microscope. So at the laboratory, I have this microscope. I can mount two specimens. There are two separate microscopes connected by an optical bridge and there's a binocular eyepiece at the top. So when I look through that binocular eyepiece, I can see images of both specimens side by side. So in the left image, there's this black line running down the center. That's what separates the two cartridge cases. So on the left side, you see my notes at the bottom here, F item two, that's my annotation for that came from item two, which is the revolver. So those are my knowns. On the right side is item three, so that's the cartridge case that was submitted. And in the photo on the left, I'm comparing those breech face marks that I spoke about earlier. So the impression of that flat surface, I'm looking at the parallel lines as, as well as the cross hatch lines. And the image on the right, I'm looking at the features down within the firing pin impression. Thank you. States Exhibit 102, what's this? These are four cartridges that were submitted for examination. And when they were submitted to you for examination, uh, were you given information about where they came from? Yes, I do have that information that's been populated into the database. And, and if you would tell us, just so that, we under, so that we know what your understanding was, just going to state of mind. Right. It appears three of these were taken from the top of a cart, and the fourth was located in a holster inside of building. Those are the descriptions that I have. Did you conduct any testing on these cartridges? Yes, I did. Tell us about that. So the process that I spoke about earlier, first I just examined the physical characteristics of these cartridges. I then x-rayed them to see if I could learn anything more about the inside and then the last step was to actually disassemble these cartridges. And after going through all of that, did you form an opinion uh, about whether these cartridges were dummies or live? So these cartridges contained the four components that are required to be live functional ammunition. So that being the cartridge case, the bullet, in the bottom here is the primer, which you see in the center of the photograph on the right, and inside the cartridge case is going to be powder, which is the, the propellant. So these four cartridges had all four of those main components, which are uh, consistent with being live ammunition. Is there writing on the head stamp of that bullet? Or the cartridge, rather? Yes, it's the head stamp of the cartridge. Um, again, so this is the bottom of the cartridge. It has the caliber, 
and these kind of flower type logos with a line indicate the manufacturer of the cartridge case. And did all of these cartridges have that same indication on the head stamp? Yes. Did all of the cartridges have the same uh, color primer? Yes. Did all of the cartridges have the same shape projectile? Yes, so you can see in the image on the left the shape of the bullet here as well as the color, the finish of the bullet. So these are what are called lead flat nose bullets. States Exhibit 103. What are we looking at here? This is a photograph of essentially a box of ammunition that was submitted to the lab. So on the right hand side you see information that's present on the exterior of the box and on the left hand side is the foam tray that's inside that box as well as the cartridges that were inside it. When this photo was taken, if you can, ex if you can tell us, had the order of the cartridges in the styrofoam insert uh, been modified? Yes, so generally a box of ammunition comes in with one item number and when I opened it up I saw various uh, various things, various calibers, various types of bullets. Um, so I started to form groups based on what was in that box and then I gave them their own sub-item number. So for instance I believe this was item 13 and I divided them based on the physical characteristics that I was seeing. So the cartridges are in different positions in the styrofoam insert um, in this photo than they may have been at the time they were taken into evidence. That is possible. I'm not sure what positions they were in at the time it was open. And did you do any testing on these cartridges that were in this box? Yes, I did the same series of testing that I've explained before. And can you summarize for us what what was in this box based on your examination and testing? May I check my notes? Just Certainly. So the, the vast majority of the cartridges that were in this box were dummy cartridges. And some of them had visual indicators. As I mentioned before, they may have a hole drilled in the side or you could shake them. And again, that's an audible indicator. However, there was one cartridge in this box that, again, it had the four components required to be live ammunition. And when you're looking at this photo, can you identify the cartridge that you believe was determined to be live? I believe it was this one here with the silver primer. Thank you. States Exhibit 104, what's this? This is actually two additional images of that cartridge that I just uh, pointed out on the screen. So this is a side view of the cartridge on the left and an image of the head stamp region on the right. I want to talk to you about the characteristics of this cartridge compared to the four live cartridges that we saw earlier. Does this cartridge have the same shape, projectile, or bullet as the other four? Yes, it does. Does it have the same indication on the head stamp? Yes. And does it have the same color primer? It does. States Exhibit 105. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? These are images of additional ammunition that was submitted uh, for examination. And these, uh, some of the ammunition came in being declared as live ammunition. So these are images of some of those cartridges that were submitted. So these are all live? They were described as being live and they had the physical characteristics of being live. Based on the information that you received, that went along with these cartridges, where did, where did these cartridges come from? May I refer? Go ahead.
These cartridges are described as having been, or excuse me, as having come from Seth Kenny. And do these cartridges, are they different than the live rounds, the five live rounds that we've seen photos of previously? There are some differences, yes. What are those? So I see differences in the morphology of the bullet, so the shape of the bullet. Uh, for instance, this first one in the top left, this is actually a nickel-plated hollow point bullet, so it's not the lead flat nose that you previously saw. Uh, the images below that, these bullet types are semi-wad colors. So again, it's just a different design of bullets, so it's, it's different in shape than the ones you previously saw. You also see additional head stamps here, such as Winchester, GFL, which is a trade name called Fioki, and as well as CBC, which is made by Magtech. Um, and this, due to the glare, it's a little difficult to see in this photo, but I also believe there's differences in the colors of the primers. And uh, let me ask you, if you were to go to a gun store and buy a box of ammunition, would the ammunition in that box have different shaped projectiles? No, if I was buying a, you know, a brand new box of ammunition, you go to Walmart, it's going to say on the outside what those bullet designs are. For example, it'll, it may say uh, jacketed hollow point, it may say round nose, it may say truncated cone. So I would expect if I open that brand new box of ammunition, all of the bullet morphologies would be the same. Thank you. States Exhibit 106. What's this? This is another uh, series of photographs of another ammunition box that was scented. So in the top left you see the exterior of the box. Bottom left you see that foam insert as well as the cartridges. And then the image of the right on the right is just those cartridges being removed from the, the tray. Can you tell us where these came from, at least what the description was that was provided to you? Do you have an item number for this by chance? I will get you one. Item 28 was described as having come from the item 27 tray, which is the tray you see here, which was described as having come from the 26 box, and the 26 box was described as coming from 126 Monroe Street. In your examination of these cartridges, were you able to make a determination about whether they were live or dummies? May I refer to this? Sure. Okay, so these cartridges were submitted being declared as being live cartridges. So basically they were submitted and it was understood that these were live functioning uh, ammunition. So I did disassemble two of these um, just to essentially verify that and the two that I disassembled again it had the four main components that are required to be live functioning ammunition. So, so the ones that I didn't they were described as being live but the two that I did had all four components required. Are there any differences in the characteristics of these live cartridges? compared to the live cartridges that came from the set of the movie Rust. Yeah, so again, in the bottom left, I see differences in primer color. These are brass as opposed to nickel. Um, I can't read the head stamps in this photograph, but as far as the bullets go, these are also different because we have the ones that have this sort of little lip above the mouth. Yeah. Sorry. Those are called semi-wad cutters, and the other ones, which you see, do not have that lip, 
These are called truncated cone. So the ones that you previously saw, these are different from flat nose because they don't have the rounded sides. It just goes straight. Uh, if you were to picture like an orange construction cone, it just goes straight up to the tip. States Exhibit 107. What's this? Well, and let's let, let's begin with what your understanding was of where they came from. Again, these were reported as coming from 126 Monroe Street. Were they provided to you? with the understanding that they were presumed live or dummy, what was... Yes, these were presumed live. And do you have an opinion about whether or not they are actually live cartridges? So in this case, I did not disassemble any of these, so I can't speak about what's inside the cartridge. So for instance, does it actually have an active primer? Does it have the propellant? So since I, I didn't disassemble these, um, I can't testify that I know what's on the inside, but again, these were described as being live. And the characteristics of these cartridges, uh, did you find them to be consistent with live ammunition? Based on the, my physical observations of the exterior, yes. And are there differences in the characteristics between these cartridges and the five cartridges that were provided to you from the set of the movie Rust? Yes, it's the same types of differences that we've been discussing. So I see differences in the head stamp, which indicates a different manufacturer, as well as the bullet morphology appears different. States Exhibit 108, what's this? Um, these are additional cartridges submitted, and again, these were submitted being declared as live cartridges. And did they appear to be consistent with live cartridges? Two of these I did disassemble, so I could verify that they had the four components of live cartridges. The rest I did not, so they were physically consistent with being live, but again, I don't have an understanding of what's occurring inside the cartridge. And same question, do these cartridges have different characteristics than the live rounds provided from the set of the movie Rust? Yes, they do, it, and it's again, it's the same. Various head stamps, various primer colors, various uh, bullet morphologies. States Exhibit 109. Hey, have you seen this before? Yes. Is States Exhibit 109 from your notes? Yes, it is. Just tell us what we're looking at. So, as Part of my examination of the ammunition, I worked with the contributor to figure out which items they wanted disassembled. So I made this chart in my notes. So this shows the images of the cartridges prior to disassembly. The middle column explains the original item number as well as what the item number that I was going to create in order to disassemble a cartridge. And then the last column is just a description of essentially what's left. So for instance, the third, the third row across, item 28 originally was all of those cartridges, but I removed two, so I sub-itemized 28-1 and 28-2, and then the third column tells you that what's left of 28 is seven remaining cartridges, and the two that I subdivided are eventually what we're going to be disassembled. And if you already testified to it, I apologize. Did you disassemble all of the uh, live rounds from the set of the movie Rust? All of the rounds that had the uh, physical characteristics of being live, yes, I disassembled those because I wanted to know if they did or did not have the components on the inside. Did you take a photograph of the gunpowder that came out of 
those disassembled rounds from the set of the movie? Yes, I did. And did you also take a photograph of the gunpowder that came out of uh, the live cartridges that came from other sources? I think you mentioned Mr. Kenny and also 126 Monroe Street. Um, did you photograph that powder? Yes, I did. And without even using a microscope, did you see differences? Yes, there were clear differences in both the shapes of the powders as well as the color, which means they may have some uh, different types of coatings on the powder. Let's move to State's Exhibit 110. Um, tell us what we're looking at here. So on the left side, you're looking at a photograph of the powder that was taken from the item 4 cartridge. So this was one that was submitted that was presumed to be live based on its uh, exterior appearance. But once I took it apart, this is the actual powder that I pulled from the inside of that cartridge. And on the right, you're looking at the same thing, but this is from item 24-1, which is one of the cartridges that was submitted as being known to be a live cartridge. And the powder, I understand on the left we're looking at powder from item 4. Uh, the, were you able to see the powder from item 5, 6, 7, and 13-1? Yes, they were all consistent, which is why I only included one photograph, because it would be four photographs, or excuse me, five photographs of the same thing. Thank you. And I'm going to use briefly a demonstrative aid. Um, Council, we're going to take our uh, morning bathroom break. Sure. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. All rise for the jury. All right, you may be seated. Council approach.
Mr. Ziegler, I just have a couple of uh, final questions for you. Uh, can you see uh, these demonstrative aids that I've uh, put side by side on the screen? Yes. And uh, can you see the writing at the bottom, the typing? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, so the image on the left, um, is that an exhibit that we've already looked at? Yes, we've previously seen this photograph. And same thing with the image on the right. Is that uh, an exhibit we've already looked at? Yes. And I'm sorry, there's that writing that was out of the frame. Uh, so I'm going to scroll up here. Is this an exhibit that we've already looked at? Yes. Uh, item 13-1. Did that come from the set of the movie Rust? Excuse me. I'm sorry. 13-1, did that come from the box that was provided to you? Yes. The box of ammunition uh, that we saw earlier. Yes, this was the box where the majority of the cartridges were in fact dummy cartridges, but this was the one that had the characteristics of being live. And just comparing the ammunition on the left and the ammunition on the right, can you see distinguishing characteristics, understanding that you cannot see the head stamp or the primer? Yes, so the, as we've previously discussed, the bullets are a different shape. And I'm going to show you States Exhibit 2, or I'm sorry, 102 on the left, and those are items 4 through 7. Uh, where did items 4 through 7 come from in terms of the description you received? Those were the ones that I previously mentioned were from the top of a cart, and with item 7 being found in a holster inside a building. Do these cartridges that we're looking at on the left and the right, uh, do they appear to be, do they appear to have the same shape projectile? Yes, they do. All right. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. Sir, good morning. Good morning. Now, Mr. Ziegler, I want to start with your, your training with the FBI. Uh, as part of that training, were you trained in, in recognizing dummy rounds? Uh, there were many portions of the training manual dedicated to ammunition, uh, ammunition components. I can't recall if there is a specific task uh, related to dummy ammunition. And and by answering that way, it sounds to me like you were not trained on the recognition and characteristics of various types of dummy rounds, correct? I don't necessarily agree with that. Well, do you remember any modules that you were trained on dummy rounds or, or, or not? Not specific, no. Okay. So you wouldn't know what a Denix round is, would you? I do not. Okay. And you wouldn't know a Denix round is from Spain and it doesn't shake and it's a dummy round. You, you're not aware of that? I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Now, also with respect to your training, you were trained in gun safety, correct? Yes, sir. And, and as an FBI agent, you're trained in gun safety, including don't point a, a weapon at anybody? I'm not an agent, but because I fire as part of my job, I have been trained in safety precautions, yes. Okay, sir, and as part of your test firing protocols, I'm sure you observe all those, those safety. Uh, not to point a gun at anybody, treat it as loaded, keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire, you observe all those? Yes, sir. Okay. And, sir, um, you indicated one of your opinions was that your first testing 
you determined this gun functioned normally. That's correct. Okay. When you were doing that functionality test on the revolver you received, what types of things did you look at on the firearm? So first I would inspect things like are there bulges in the barrel, cracks in the frame, things things that I may think lead to may lead to a catastrophic failure during the testing. Okay, sir, do you take that revolver apart in the initial stage? I do not. So later on and I'll come back to this, but you indicated when you hit that hammer with your mallet that it fractured some internal components, correct? Correct. And there was um, the sear, we saw uh, a little piece of the trigger, uh, you remember, sir? Yes. Now, because you did not open the revolver uh, prior to doing the, that hammer test, uh, can you be certain those weren't, any of those pieces weren't broken before? I would say I can't be 100% certain, however, because it did function normally, I would expect those pieces were intact at the time I received it and did that initial examination. Okay, and when you um, visually examined it from the outside, you then test fired that weapon 12 times, is that right? As It was 12 times throughout the process, but yes. And you observed uh, when you did that that it had to be fully cocked and that that trigger had to be depressed to fire it, correct? Aside from the hammer being at rest and being struck on a loaded chamber. Correct. And other than those tests you did, I'm talking about the first part, uh, it fired normally? Correct. Okay. Um, now, after you did that normal gun functionality testing, you're to determine its functioning, you then do what's called accidental discharge testing, is that right? That was after the microscopic comparisons were done, so that was the last test that I did. Okay, so you, you do the functionality, then you do the microscopic examination we saw, and then you do the accidental discharge. Correct. Okay. Now, the accidental discharge, you mentioned that you um, consult the FBI SOP. That's correct. Now, an SOP is a standard operating procedure? Yes, sir. Now, under that standard operating procedure, were you to do a, a type of test called a drop test? So the drop test is, I would say that's a subcategory of accidental discharge where I physically drop the firearm to see if it will fire. And that is typically only done if that is as the situation has been reported by the contributor. So that was not uh, relevant in this case. Okay, when you say in uh, a drop test, we, you can tell the jury more, that's when you from a distance of about four feet, uh, drop the weapon, and if it lands and it's, it fires, that's what you're trying to determine, correct? It depends on how the situation is being reported. So within that same SOP, it, it provides the examiner some discretion as uh, in regards to how that is believed to occur. So for instance, say I'm cleaning my gun and I accidentally knock it off the table, and I'm saying that caused it to fire. I would try to replicate that situation. If I had a gun leaning against a door and I'm saying that the door opened and the firearm fell, I would try to replicate that situation. So yes, the traditional drop test is just it being held as you would to shoot it and dropping it, but there is some discretion that's allowed if it is being reported in a certain way. Okay, and, and you're familiar with SAMI standards, are you not? Yes. And SAMI is the Sporting Arms and Ammunition Manufacturing Institute, is that correct? That is correct. They were commissioned by the federal government about 100 years ago to come up with industry-type standards? Uh, I don't know when they were instituted, but yes, they come up with standards for ammunition as far as dimensions and things like that. 1926. Were you aware of that? Uh, not off the top of my head. Okay. So in their SAMI standards, there is a uh, standardized drop test. You're aware of that? I'm not. Okay, but that's the industry standard for firearms across the country, this type of testing, right? Multiple states use this? I wouldn't say that's the industry standard, and also their industry is different from the forensic industry. Okay, and, and you also know there's, um, there's no type of shock test. Do you know what a shock test is? Uh, in regards to what? into, well, it's kind of what you did with the mallet. 
Um, are you familiar with the National Institute of Justice? They call it a shock test. Um, I'm not familiar with that test. Okay. So when you um, made your determination to hit that revolver with a mallet, is that part of the SOP that you, you hit it with a mallet? That is written in the SOP, yes. How many times have you done that as a forensic examiner? How many weapons have you done that on? I would say probably less than 10, and uh, this is the first one that I've had in actual casework. Okay, so in actual casework, what do you mean by that? Uh, as opposed to training. Oh, in training. So the other nine were done in training when you hit it with the mallet. I, I don't know the exact number, but yes. So this training. is literally the first time in your career as a forensic examiner that you've ever, in cases, hit a revolver with a hammer. That is correct. So um, is it fair to say you've never had this situation where you've hit a revolver and it's broken before? Uh, not in a case. Okay. Did that happen in training? I, I don't know about it specifically being a revolver, but yes, I have done it in training where the firearms do break. And you earlier told, told us that you base your discretion on that accidental discharge test on input given to you about what might have happened. Not the accidental discharge test. That would be the drop test. Drop test. So you didn't have any information this was hit with some kind of hammer on the rest set, correct? That's correct. I did not. Okay, but you chose to do this, and then you you hit it, hit the weapon with the hammer resting in the resting position, right? Yes. And then you did in the full cock position, correct? It it was not in that order, but you are correct. Okay, and I'm not I'm not trying to um, mix it up, but when you hit it with the full cock position, that's when you broke the internal components. Yes. Now, do you know how hard you hit that? I do not. So on a drop test, would you agree with me, you're trying to eliminate variables. Um, so in other words, gravity is the same, right? Sure. Gravity's not going to change. So if you drop that gun from four feet every time and you know the weight of that gun, you're eliminating variables, correct? I suppose so. Okay. Well, have you been taught that at all in the FBI? Uh, no. The purpose of these tests is not to figure out exactly what height or exactly what amount of force or exactly how many numbers of times you have to strike this firearm to get it to fire. It's just to, it's just to try to generally replicate the situations and see if the firearm will fire without pulling the trigger. Well, sir, so did you ever measure the, the trigger pull force on that revolver? I did. You did? Yes. What was the trigger pull force? Uh, may I refer to my notes? Yes, sir. Between two and two and a half pounds. Two and a half pounds, okay. Did you measure the weight of that firearm? The weight of the... Of the revolver? No. Okay. So, and you have no idea the foot-pounds of pressure that you were applying to that hammer when you hit it with the mallet, correct? Right. There's no way to quantify that. And there's no way to quantify when you do that six times if you're hitting it the same amount every time, right? That's correct. As, as a human being, I mean, you're not going to hit it the exact same every time. I, I believe that's true, yes. Okay. So um, as we sit here, we don't know what amount of force was required to break that hammer and the in internal parts, correct? That's correct. We do not. Okay. So if there was a question um, whether or not uh, an external force of some type hit that hammer, we don't know from your testing what amount of force that was that would cause that. You are correct. Okay. If you, um, were you given any other information regarding um, the accidental discharge testing that you, you can recall? Um, initially, Initially, that test was not requested. It was not part of the initial exam. That, uh, the de decision to do that test came in later conversations with the case agent. Okay. Um, so initially, they did not even ask you to do that, but it was sometime later they did. Correct. 
Um, and did you have any understanding as to why you were going to do that? Uh, I believe it had something to do with uh, one of the individuals involved stating that the hammer, or excuse me, the trigger was not pulled. Was that Alec Baldwin? I believe so. And and based on your testing on the functionality, that comment about the trigger not being pulled could not have happened. <clears throat> I I wouldn't say. I can't say it's impossible because I can't account for every single variable. All I can testify to is the results of my testing. Okay, so when I received the firearm and I did that initial function examination, it did not appear that any of the safeties were malfunctioning or anything like that. So it was functioning normally when I received it. And to be fair, sir, um, you did indicate earlier you did do this in a lab. So you can't account for all the variables that might occur on a movie set, for example? Sure. Okay. So your testimony and you're telling the jury that you can account for the variables you, you're aware of, but you cannot account for variables you might not be aware of? Sure. Okay. And some of those variables, and we'll come to the rounds in a little bit, but some of those variables include uh, if you do not receive evidence or request to test it, you're not going to test that, obviously. That's true. Okay. Um, with regard to the uh, hammer testing, you mentioned earlier that this could be destroyed permanently as part of your testing. So you got permission to do this test, correct? Yes. And that would have been for the sheriffs? Well, my point of contact was a special agent out of Albuquerque. So I would funnel information to him. He would discuss that with the detectives, and then they would uh, distribute the answer back to me. And that was Jose Cortez? That's correct. Okay. And Mr. Cortez is the one that sent you the request by um, submission, written submission, for what he wanted you to do, correct? Uh, as far as the communication, is that what you're referring to? Yes, sir. I'm referring to your report. Um, there is a submission. October 28, 2021, from Jose Cortez requesting various tasks to be done? Yes. Okay, and then there's another one, 12 14, 2021. Same thing. So he's your liaison that goes back and forth between the sheriffs and yourself, and he makes those requests? That's correct. Okay. Now, so you got permission to possibly destroy this revolver permanently. They gave that to you. I received permission to conduct the test. And you made it aware to them that this could destroy the weapon? Yes. Okay. When you did uh, destroy that, you broke several internal parts? Yes. Okay. And then we saw that on the exhibit. You took those apart to show what, what had happened. Correct? Correct. Okay. Now, you also said that you did not see any modifications as to that firearm, correct? Uh, at what point? You testified that in your functionality examination, you also t uh, determined whether it had been modified or not. You, you Right. So that's generally in regards to things like, has the barrel been cut? Has the stock been cut? Has this been modified to fire fully automatic? So when I talk about modifications, that's what I'm referring to, and I did not see any of those things. Okay, and as far as internal modifications, you did, did you look at that? No, because I can't disassemble the firearm because I have to test it in the condition it's received. Okay, but from your uh, viewing it and your observation, you didn't notice anything that would tell you it was modified. Right, nothing jumped out immediately. Okay. Now, you also mentioned that the, the full cock notch, which was the one we saw in that picture, kind of a little circle. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay, sir, you, you said that it looked a little flatter, per, potentially? Compared to the quarter and half cock, yes. It, was, it didn't have as much of a uh, claw shape to it. But you could not... Uh, that did not, you did not conclude that that had been modified. You're not certain it had been modified. Right, I'm not certain. It's a very small surface that we're talking about. So it's, it's possible, you know, it may have been modified, it may have been damaged during the exam, 
or it could also be one of the firearms that just doesn't have a very pronounced sear notch there. Okay, so you just you just don't know for sure. Correct, I don't. Know. Okay. Um, now, I want to turn to the rounds. Uh, one of the things I heard you say several times is there's four components to determine a live round. Is that right, sir? Yes, a live cartridge has four main components. And you said the case, the projectile or bullet, the primer, and then the powder. Correct. So uh, you also testified earlier that when you uh, were given presumed live rounds, but you did not disassemble them, you could not confirm they were live because you didn't get inside to see the powder. Right, so there were certain cartridges that, again, I discussed this plan with the case agent, the contributor, to try to figure out which ones we needed to take apart. So there was a subset that we uh, concluded needed to be disassembled. So for example, the ones that were presumed to be live, we needed to see what was on the inside of those cartridges. However, they sent quite a few live, uh, presumed live cartridges. So it didn't make sense to take apart every single piece of ammunition that they sent in. So we came up with a sampling plan to where we just determined we were going to take apart some of them as a representative sample. Sure, and and I guess my question too was, you can't tell something is a live round until you make that final step to determine if there's powder inside. Yes, that is true. Okay, so you could not, for example, in your FBI training, you could not look at a picture and determine that's definitively a live round. I wouldn't do that based on a photograph, no. Okay. And that's part of your FBI training that you would have to go through the four components, take it apart, make sure there's powder, and that's what gives you the confirmation, correct? I would say yes. You, mm -hmm. In order to know for sure, you would have to be able to see the powder, yeah. Okay. That's how you've been trained? Um, I would say it's, it's training related to ammunition and just understanding the components of the ammunition. Okay. Now, as part of this also, you uh, identified rounds that were live, and those were items, and we saw it on the last slide, items 1, B, 4 through 7, is that correct? Uh, it's, those aren't the 1B numbers, I don't believe, it's, it's the lab numbers. And it was items 4 through 7 and 13 1. You're right, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was 4 through 7 and 13 1. Correct. Were the lives, okay. Now, you later in December uh, received a request from Mr. Cortez, Agent Cortez, to conduct um, DNA testing. Is that right? Your, your lab did? Um, I'm not completely certain of that. Objection Foundation. And I, I can ask you a question on that, Your Honor. Okay. Does that does that request uh, for DNA testing go to you, or does it go to another person in your lab? Well, I'm going to object to Foundation again. If he doesn't know what request he's talking about, he can't answer. Can you be more specific? Yes. And I can show you, sir, uh, the report. Objecting to foundation. Why are you showing him a report that he hasn't seen? You haven't seen your own report? Have you seen your own report? Cool. My report would not include anything related to DNA, so I'm not sure which report you're referring to. Okay, I'm just referring to the submission to the FBI lab by Jose A. Cortez, dated 12 14 2021. And did you see that? I'd, I'd have to look at it. Okay. If I may approach your honor. Hold on for a second. Are you having a problem with that? Okay. okay. All right, sir, I'm going to show you uh, this request from 12 14 2021. If you could just look at it, don't tell us what it is, but just read it to yourself. And then they don't have to read the whole thing. Is your memory now refreshed on that? So that is not my report. That is an electronic communication from the field office of the case agent being Jose Cortez. Okay, and you're not, you did not receive that personally? 
Uh, eventually I received that. Okay, so you have seen it. Yes. Okay, so you know that certain standards were submitted in this case. Are you aware of that regarding fingerprints and DNA? I, I'm sure I've seen that, but that's not related to my discipline, so that doesn't affect my examination. So that's, I don't know that I, you know, that's not noteworthy to me. Okay, so you reviewed it, but you did not participate in that. Correct. And right as we're sitting right now, you don't know what was submitted in terms of the people uh, and their standards. Is that right? I do not. Okay. Um, with regard to the live rounds we were seeing on those exhibits earlier, did you measure the projectile tops on each of those rounds? No, I did not. Okay. And so you're not, a, not able to tell us whether there are differences uh, at all or not in the size of those projectile tops? When you say the top, you're talking about the flat portion? The flat portion. And you're referencing the diameter of that flat portion? Correct. Uh, no, I can't tell you if those are consistent, just the shape is consistent. Okay. When you took the powder out of the rounds, did you weigh that powder? I don't believe I did. Okay, so you're not certain whether the rounds were full of powder or partially full of powder or not? I'm not. Okay. Let me ask you, going back to the gun, I missed one question. Before you conducted that, that test fire, did you look in the barrel with a borescope? No. Okay. With regard to the rounds that came from Seth Kinney, you were told on the, well, you have them in your report, and the Monroe Street address, you have no idea what time those were seized or what date those were seized? Uh, I don't off the top of my head that may be in the paperwork that was submitted, but I don't know that. Okay. And you have no idea where Seth Kenny brought the rounds that he submitted? I do not. And he didn't submit them to you, correct? No, we receive evidence from the case agents. Okay. And you didn't personally conduct any fingerprint or DNA testing because that's out of your specialty? That's correct. I did not. Okay. Earlier you were talking about the different types of ammo from 126 Monroe Street. Do you recall that you were showing live, dummy, and blank, all three types? Uh, can you ask that question again? Sure. Um, as part of your examination of the rounds from 126 Monroe Street, you're aware that there were live rounds, blank rounds, and dummy rounds. Objection. Uh, that misstates the facts that are already in evidence. Let him answer the question. Do you have specific item numbers that I can reference? Um, well, I can so ask for clarification if that's helpful. Sure, absolutely. We we saw some exhibits from 126 Monroe Street, and if you want to look at your report to check out those items and determine if there were both live rounds, dummy rounds, and then if there were blanks. your question yes sir so the ammunition that I have as being reported from that address includes items 28 31 32 33 34 
36, and 37. And these were the cartridges that were submitted as being known live ammunition. Some of them I disassembled, but not all of them because there were too many. So all of these were either physically consistent with live ammunition based on their exterior appearance, or the ones that I actually did disassemble, I could determine it had the four main components. Okay. All right, and thank you for looking for that. Uh, now, with regard to uh, the set, the live rounds you found on set, did you do any further testing on those uh, with regard to the powder or anything like that, or is that out of your discipline? Uh, that goes beyond my discipline. There was another unit that did some testing on the powder, um, but I can't testify to that. Okay. You're going to just a moment? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. We have uh, no further questions. Right, thank you. Redirect. Briefly, thank you. Mr. Ziegler, why not disassemble every round that was provided to you that was what I'm going to call presumed live? All right, there were hundreds of rounds submitted in total. So, for instance, you may have one item number, but that was an entire box of 50 cartridges. So, in totality, just from practical purposes as well as, you know, what is the result, what, what impact will this have on the result? It didn't make sense to disassemble every single cartridge that was submitted. Did you x-ray any of the ammunition that was provided to you that was presumed live? Yes, I x-rayed every cartridge that was submitted. You x-rayed every single cartridge? I did. So you didn't disassemble every single cartridge, but you x-rayed every single cartridge? That's true. What did the x-ray images tell you? about those presumed live cartridges. May I refer to certainly I just wanted to verify I did x-ray every cartridge and what that told me is there were indicators in the dummy cartridges that I could see in the x-ray. So whether they would be the holes in the size of the cartridge case, I could see that on an x-ray. As well, some of them had metal BBs, so the metal BBs showed up in the x-ray. So the live cartridges, the gunpowder does not show up. That's not visible. But I didn't see any of those other indicators to suggest that they may be something else that, you know, other than what they were reported as being. And just to be clear, the dummy cartridges that you examined and disassembled, there were no dummy cartridges that came from 126 Monroe Street. That's correct. Every cartridge that I have as being listed from that address was either consistent with being live or I actually disassembled it and it had the components of being live. And, and when you say consistent with being live, not only are you talking about the um, physical characteristics, but also the x-rays. That's true. There was no indication uh, from the x-ray that they were anything else. Uh, you testified on cross-examination that of those live rounds that were provided to you, you took a representative sample, and those were the ones that you disassembled. Correct. Can you tell us how you decided which rounds to include in your representative sample for disassembly? Right, so as I mentioned before, working with the contributor, there were certain ones that they needed to have disassembled, but then when it came to, to these exemplars, um, we agreed to do a random sampling. And the way that I chose that, it was random as far as the item numbers go, but I also looked for cartridges that had similar head stamps. So I was trying to see if similar exemplars might have 
similar features on the inside. In any of the presumed live rounds that you disassembled after putting them into your representative sample, did any of them turn out to be dummies? Yes, there was actually one that from the exterior appearance and the x-ray, um, I didn't see any indication that it was a dummy round. Um, and then after disassembling that, I found there was no powder and you, could, you can see down into the primer pocket, it was hollow, so it was an inactive primer. So there was one cartridge that was submitted that on the outside appeared live, but upon further inspection did not have the four components required to fire a cartridge. Can you tell us what item number that was? It was item 22. And can you tell us uh, what your understanding was in terms of the description where item 22 came from? And specifically, I'd like to know, did it come from 126 Monroe or Mr. Kenny? Um, item 22 is a cartridge from the item 20 box, which is a box with tape from the prop truck. Thank you, sir. Do you have to measure those projectiles or bullets to be able to see that they are different than the projectiles in the live rounds from the movie set? No, they, they have distinct shapes in morphology and some of them have uh, distinct coatings such as a uh, one of the projectiles was a nickel coated hollow point bullet. You can just see that with your naked eye. You can, and uh, the photographs with glare and the print quality may not show it as well, but if you had the bullets, you know, the cartridges in your hand, you would be able to see distinct shapes. All of the items that you had, that you tested, that you examined, when your testing is complete, what do you do with them? Um, they get packaged in their appropriate outer packaging um, and then they get returned to the field through uh, we have a unit at the laboratory that helps us out with this called the evidence management unit. So they basically inventory everything, make sure everything uh, that's supposed to be there is still there and they're the ones that ultimately return it to the field. And when you say they return it to the field, does it go right back to the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office? Um, Typically, if it's associated with an FBI case, it's going to go to the FBI field office. Do you know what happened in this case? I do not. Okay, thank you. Nothing further. All right, you're excused. Thank you. Thank you. The state calls Shannon Fritz. To remind um, any witnesses in this case that haven't been called, except expert witnesses, to stay off the live stream. Face the judge and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right. Have a seat. Talking to the microphone. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Would you please state your name for the record? My name is Shannon Prince. My last name is spelled P-R-I-N-C-E. And where are you currently employed? I'm currently employed at the FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. And what's your title at the FBI? I am a physical scientist, forensic examiner. How long have you been, been employed in the latent print discipline? Over 19 years. And are you a member of any professional organizations related to your employment? Yes, I am. I'm a member of the International Association for Identification. And do you instruct any courses in the latent print uh, uh, discipline? 
Yes, I do. I instruct courses on latent print processing, which is using chemicals to develop latent prints, as well as post-mortem processing, which is using fingerprints to identify the unknown deceased. And do you take proficiency tests as part of your uh, ongoing um, work at the FBI? Yes. Um, how often and how many? I take one proficiency test each year in comparing prints, and I've taken one test every five years in processing uh, latent prints. Have you ever failed a proficiency test? No, I have not. All right. And are you a certified latent print examiner? Yes, I am. I am a board certified latent print examiner with the International Association for Identification. Great. Um, Your Honor, at this time I move the court to recognize Ms. Prince as an expert witness in the area of latent fingerprint examination. Any no. objection? No objection. All right. You're uh, recognized as an expert in latent print fingerprint examination. Thank you. All right, why don't you give us a, an idea about what your duties are as a latent print examiner? I receive a variety of evidence from either FBI field offices or state, local, and tribal officers. I receive this evidence in the laboratory and then I examine that evidence with a variety of chemicals, powders, or light sources. When I develop latent prints, I then compare those latent prints to known prints of individuals and come to conclusions. I may search those latent prints in a fingerprint database, such as a computer, to uh, make identifications. And then I provide a report based on my results. I can also testify in the court of law on those results. You mentioned you work with a known fingerprint. Can you explain to us what a known fingerprint is? On the palm side of your hand, you have these raised portions of skin called friction ridges. They form patterns on your hand. You also have them on the soles of your feet. In order to record a known print, the, print, the finger is usually rolled in black printer's ink and then rolled on a contrasting white background, such as a fingerprint card, and that creates a known print. These days, it's often recorded by placing your finger on a flatbed scanner and it creates a digital copy of your fingerprint. And you also mentioned latent fingerprints. What is a latent fingerprint? A latent print is the unintentional or chance reproduction of your friction ridge skin when you touch an object. When you touch an object, you may leave a latent print. It's often left in the oils and sweat on your hand, but it can be left in other substances such as blood, dirt, grease, ketchup. It's often not readily visible and requires a forensic light source such as a laser, a chemical or a powder to be made visible. And how are fingerprints compared and identifications affected? It's a three-step process which is, an, which is called Analysis, Comparison, Evaluation or ACE, A-C-E, where I analyze latent prints looking if they're suitable, then I can compare those latent prints and known prints side by side, and then making an evaluation decision where I can make one of three decisions. An identification decision, the latent print and known print were made by the same person. An exclusion decision where the latent print and known print were not made by the same person. Or an inconclusive decision where I don't have enough information to make a conclusive decision. Often this is times when a fingerprint card, like a known card, is smeared or smudged or it has too much ink. I can't make a conclusive comparison because that print is too poor to make a conclusive decision. Great. And when you receive evidence for latent print exams, um, what factors do you consider prior to starting your examination? I look at what type of evidence it is. Um, it could be a porous item, which means it's like paper, or money, or cardboard. Um, I also look if it's semi-porous, which is kind of a shiny cardboard. Or if it's non-porous, which is smooth or shiny, like aluminum, plastic, glass. So I look at what type of evidence it is to determine what chemicals or light sources I'm going to need. And then I look at the condition of the evidence. Is the evidence broken? Is it shattered? Is it dirty? Is it covered with something? Or was it previously processed in the field by a crime scene investigator? I look at all that in order to determine what exams I will do and how I will proceed with those exams. Great. Um, I'm going to show you what was previously marked as State's Exhibit 63. And let's see. Do you recognize that photograph? Yes, I do. Uh, have you have you actually seen the original uh, version of what did that photograph demonstrates before? Yes, I have. All right. Um, and where, where did you see that? I saw that back at the FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. All right. And did you examine Exhibit 63 for latent prints? 
Yes, I did. All right, what specific examinations did you conduct on this item? So this item of evidence is an ammunition box, and it's semi-porous, meaning it's shiny paper, but it also has non-porous qualities. So the first examination I do is simple visual examination, looking to see if there's any visible prints. You do this every day when you see fingerprints on your cell phone or on a garage door or a mirror. That's a visual examination. So I first do that exam. And then I take this box into a dark room where I have a green light or a laser, a blue light or an ultraviolet light, and I shine that light on the object while I'm wearing orange or yellow goggles to see if any prints may fluoresce. At this point, I've used no chemicals on this item. The next process I use is called super glue fuming, where I place this item in a chamber, I hang it in a chamber, and then in the chamber I heat super glue at a high temperature. The, the super glue starts to fume. It starts to appear like white fumes. Those fumes adhere to any kind of moisture that might be on that object, and it creates a white print. And I can either see that print visually, or I need a reflective ultraviolet light to be able to see those prints. Then I also do a magnetic powder right after that process. The magnetic powder is black, since it's the white box, so it's contrasting. And I can see if there's any uh, visible prints that way. The black powder, black magnetic powder, adheres to the white superglue prints. And then I take this box and use a chemical called indanedione, I-N-D-A-N-E-D-I-O-N-E. -E. This is a chemical that is sprayed on the item and then it is placed in a humidity chamber where a chemical reaction is sped up. This chemical it, um, develops any kind of amino acid that may be in your sweat and it creates a pink or orange print. Um, and I can see that print either visually or in a dark room with a light source. And finally, I take a fluorescent dye stain and I spray this orange chemical on this box and it adheres to those super glue prints as well and I can see those prints in a dark room with an ultraviolet light or a laser. And just to be clear, you did all of that, you did all of those tests with regard to the box that's in this photograph, correct? Yes. All right, and what was the result of your testing? On this box, I de developed 10 latent fingerprints. All right. Um, did you compare the latent prints that you detected uh, on Exhibit 63 to the known prints of any individuals? Yes, I did. Which individuals did you compare those known prints to? I compared these prints to Hannah Gutierrez, Sarah Zachary, David Halls, and Alec Baldwin. And did you find a match? Yes. Who did you find a match for? Two of these latent prints were identified to Hannah Gutierrez. All right. And were you able to find matches to any of the other known samples? No. All right. And were you able to exclude any of the other individuals uh, based on your test? The remaining prints were excluded as being prints from Sarah Zachary, David Halls, and Alec Baldwin. Thank you. Um, did you also examine a second ammunition box as part of this case? Yes. Does this appear to be a photograph of that box? It is. All right. Um, Can you give us the exhibit number? Oh, I apologize. This is uh, State's Exhibit 48. Uh, where did you see this box prior to today? At the FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. All right. And uh, did you examine this box for latent prints? Yes, I did. And uh, did you conduct the same type of analysis that you did on the previous box? Yes, um, the examinations I conducted on this box were the exact chemicals, light sources, and powders that I used on the previous box. Great. And what was the result of your examination of this box? There were three latent fingerprints detected on this box. All right, and were you able to compare those latent prints to the known samples of any individuals? Yes. And who were those folks? I compared the three latent fingerprints to Hannah Gutierrez, Sarah Zachary, David Halls, and Alec Baldwin. And did you find any positive matches for any of those individuals? There were no identifications. Were you able to find any exclusions? Yes. Uh, Sarah Zachary and Alec Baldwin were excluded from the three latent prints detected on this item, and Hannah Gutierrez and David Hall were inconclusively compared to these prints. All right. So just to be clear, Sarah Zachary, you didn't find her fingerprints on this box whatsoever? The three latent prints were excluded from being Sarah Zachary. Great. Um, 
Is it possible to touch an item and not leave a latent print? Yes. And, and what kind of circumstances might that occur? There are several circumstances where you can touch an item and not leave a latent print. First of all, you could be wearing gloves or a mitten, and when you touch an object, you may not leave a latent print because your skin is not having contact with that object. You may have too much sweat or too little sweat on your hand, and that may not leave a latent print. The surface itself may be dirty or textured, and it's difficult to leave a latent print on a dirty or textured surface. The print may be on a surface where if it's overhandled, such as if I put my hand here, and the next person comes and put their hand here, someone at the end of the day puts another hand here, it's overhandled and that could wipe away any prints that may be on an item. There's also environmental conditions, wind, rain, snow, um, heat and humidity. Those can all play a factor of whether a latent print is detected on an item. And did you attempt to do any uh, examination of cartridge casings in this case? Yes. And what was the result of that examination? I examined four cartridge cases and there were no suitable latent prints detected on those cartridge cases. And is it unusual for you to, uh, for you to be unable to identify a latent print on a cartridge casing? It is not unusual. And why, why not? Cartridge cases, when they go through a firearm, there's a lot of heat and friction, and that can destroy a latent print. Also, it's a very small surface that's on a cartridge case, so leaving a suitable print can be difficult. Um, and it's also a smooth surface, so any kind of movement that comes into contact with a cartridge case may destroy a print on a cartridge case. Great. Have you worked on any other cases where there were a, a large number of cartridge casing rounds that you attempted to examine for latent prints? Yes, I have. Um, can you give us an example of a case where you worked and then and, and explain to us, um, based on the, a number, the number of casings that you found, how many actually were found to contain latent prints? Um, a case that uh, I have been a part of um, was the Las Vegas shooting um, several years ago where there was a significant amount of firearms, ammunition, and magazines in that case. Uh, specifically to the ammunition, which, included, which consisted of uh, shot shells as well as cartridges, we processed and examined over 6,900 pieces of ammunition, um, where we only detected 26 prints on those 6,909 uh, ammunition. That's 0.38%, so it's a very low chance of developing prints on um, ammunition. Uh, we detected, um, we also processed firearms in that case. Uh, we processed about 40 firearms in that case, and we detected prints on 12% of those firearms. And then we processed over 180 magazines in that case, and we only detected prints on 9.7% of firearms. So it's a very low chance of getting prints on firearms or ammunition based on the size of the item, the texture of the item, as well as overhandling of those items. Those are all reasons why there's a low recovery rate on firearms and ammunition. Thank you. Um, and the, the four cartridge casings uh, that you attempted to do uh, fingerprint examination in this case, um, on your notes, does it indicate what the source of those cartridge casings was? I'd have to refer to my notes for the specific source of those cartridge cases. Do you mind? May I? Yes. I don't have a specific source. I just have um, the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office item number. Wait, do you mind providing that? It's item 144. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. Question, team. Ma'am, good morning. Good morning. Okay. With regard to uh, your work, when you compare a Latin print against a standard, um, you were given those standards from the agency. For example, here the sheriffs, correct? Yes. So here you had four people as standards, is that correct? Yes. And that was Mr. Halls, Sarah Zachary, Alec Baldwin, and Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, is that right? That's correct. Okay, so one of those people you did not receive standards uh, from is a guy named Seth Kenny, correct? Correct. And so of all the other people on the set, the only four you received standards from were those four? That is correct. Okay. 
And those standards included Latin prints, I mean uh, fingerprint cards, and DNA? The standards I received were fingerprints and palm prints from Gutierrez, Zachary, and Halls, and I only had a fingerprint card for Alec Baldwin. Okay, you didn't have a palm print for him? I did not. Now, I know from... I know that uh, you had stated that Halls and Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, Mr. Halls and, and her prints were not completely rolled, or they were overrolled. Correct. Their known standards were not complete. There was some over-inking in one area, um, and when a fingerprint card is fully rolled, it's usually from nail to nail, where you can get the whole finger. This case, on some of these standards, the finger wasn't fully rolled completely. Therefore, I did not have enough information to do a conclusive comparison. So, when you don't have that completely rolled from the agency submitting to you, it's difficult for you to do a conclusive comparison. It does make it difficult. Okay. And that was the case here with Ms. Gutierrez-Reed and with Mr. Halls? Yes, it was. With regard to the prints that you were able to uh, conclude, and you indicated Ms. Gutierrez-Reed's prints were found on one of the boxes? That is correct. Now, you were able to conclusively do that because? Um, I was able to conclusively do that because some fingers had that comparable area. So if there was an area that I can compare completely, I can make that conclusive decision. And in those two identifications, I was able to conclusively compare and make an identification. And with regard to the uh, other box that we saw, you found three leaden prints. That's correct. And you indicated that Ms. Zachary and Mr. Baldwin were excluded, correct? Correct and that Mr. Halls and Ms. Gutierrez-Reed were inconclusively compared, is that correct? That is correct. And that was because, again, you told the jury that you didn't have a complete, um, well-rolled set of fingerprints. That is correct. All right. And that would have been something the agency, the sheriffs would have provided? Those uh, standards came directly from the sheriff's office. Did anybody uh, ever communicate with you, and, and was there communication regarding we need new fingerprint standards? There was no communication. In my report, I indicated that if further comparisons needed to be conducted, that um, standards would have to be submitted. In your report, uh, and if you need to refer to it to refresh your memory, uh, you, were not, you did not conduct fingerprint analysis on items 4 through 7 and item 13 1, correct? I'd have to refer to those specific numbers. Absolutely. You said 4 through 7? 4 through 7 and 13 1. 13 1. I did not conduct examinations on those items. Okay. So the ones that you conducted it on, we've seen today? Yes. Okay. Now, with regard to the case you worked on, the Las Vegas shooting, you talked about the low percentage and the ability to recover prints from fire cartridges, correct? From all types of ammunition. Okay. Now, with regard to unfired cartridge, unfired ammunition, they don't go through that heat of the barrel, correct? That is correct. And so does that make it more likely prints can be found on those cartridges? The same percentage um, refers to that as well, less than 1%. Um, it's due to overhandling of cartridges or shot shells, um, the surface, the smooth surface, um, and a variety of other reasons that it could be a low, stand, a low chance of recovering prints on unspent cartridges. On unspent cartridges, okay, but it is possible, even very low possibility, it is possible to recover them. It is. Okay. Um, and you have listed um, there's certain elements that might come into that, like overhandling, that kind of thing. For example, the box you said earlier, that was handled by another unit? The box, what specific box are you oh, talking sorry, about? Oh, I'm sorry, not the box. I was talking about, you mentioned in your report that there was some overhandling and one of your employees came up as contributing eight fingerprints to one of the items. Correct. One of the uh, boxes was sent to the firearms unit first, um, which is um, on the, usually on the latter end of examinations when it flows to the laboratory, but this box came in and was specifically for that unit. Um, and then after the uh, firearm examinations were conducted, the request was to do latent prints. So it was kind of backwards in order. Therefore, this item of evidence was handled by the firearms unit and a firearms employee was identified 
on that box. And that was eight of the prints out of a total of 10 or 11 were the employee, right? Eight out of 10 were identified to an FBI laboratory employee. And ideally that should have gone to you first? In a, in a regular case, um, the, the evidence is usually where it goes to a, a unit that can have less destructive examinations on it to more destructive. That's how it kind of moves the laboratory. Um, and this box initially went to the firearms unit first. Thank you, Anna. No further questions. I just have one quick question for you. Um, Mr. Bowles mentioned items 4 through 7 and 13-1. Um, can you tell the jury why you weren't able to perform a print comparison on those cartridges? Um, I do not what the, are they cartridge cases? I don't have them in my report, so I never received those items. Okay, fair enough, thank you. All right, your excuse, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. We're gonna take our lunch break now. All right, so um, be back downstairs at 11, at uh, 1230. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Thank you. Take your tablets with you. All rise for the jury. Yes.
You may be seated. Council? Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Robert Gillette. Do you have your... So you'll step up here, face the judge, you're going to raise your hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, thank you. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. Great. Would you please state your name for the record? My name is Robert Gillette, last name spelled G-I-L-L-E-T-T-E. And where are you currently employed? I am employed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation within the Explosives Unit, which is part of the Laboratory Division. And how long have you worked for the FBI? I started with the FBI in 2009 as a contractor. I was hired on as an employee in 2012. And what's your official title? My official title is Chemist Forensic Examiner. And how long have you been working as a Chemist Forensic Examiner? For about 11 years now. All right. Can you give us a brief wrap-up of your educational background? I have a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Chemistry from George Mason University. It's in Fairfax, Virginia. And do you have any training and experience in Chemist Forensic Examination? Specifically, to become a qualified Chemist Forensic Examiner, I had to complete a training program. That training program started with supervised casework, so casework where supervised either chemists or chemistry examiners oversaw my actions. It included knowledge checks on the different types of instruments that I used, and then competency tests for all of the different procedures that we had. So after that, I had to successfully complete multiple oral boards of examinations in topics that covered explosives, the chemistry of explosives, as well as the different analytical techniques that we use in the laboratory. And then after that came two different moot court exercises that I had to successfully complete, as well as supervised case reporting. And then I was a qualified Chemist Forensic Examiner. Have you ever been recognized by a court as an expert in this field in the past? Yes, I have. Great. At this time, Your Honor, I'd move the court to recognize Mr. Gillette as an expert witness in the field of chemical forensic examination. No objection. All right, an expert in chemical forensic examination. That's it. All right, Mr. Gillette, how did you become involved in this case? For this case, I was asked to perform explosives chemistry examinations on what were suspected to be ammunition propellant samples. And what sort of testing were you asked to perform? Well, that was the explosives chemistry examinations. Can you describe exactly what that testing is? Yes, it starts with a visual examination, literally looking at what we have to determine where it's going to fit within the different procedures that we have for examining explosives or materials used to make explosives. After that visual examination, it'll point me towards a specific procedure. And in this case, they ended up being what's known as, or they appeared to be what's called smokeless powders. It's a type of ammunition propellant. So we have a technical procedure specifically for that. And the first step is visual examination. So I continued my visual examination and used a microscope to look at the specific particles under a microscope, but also to take photographs and make measurements because that's part of our examination. After the visual examination came what's called a solvent extraction, literally using a liquid to ideally extract out the components of those individual particles so that they could be analyzed. And then I analyzed that solvent, that liquid, using an instrument called a gas chromatograph coupled to a mass spectrometer. 
A chromatograph is an instrument that simply or ideally separates out a mixture into its individual components so that each individual component can be identified, detected and identified, and that's what the mass spectrometer does. And after that, those samples, after they had been extracted by the solvent, they were uh, analyzed using a technique called Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. And spectroscopy techniques or spectroscopic techniques are just techniques where you have a known amount of energy that interacts with the sample and those interactions can give information as to the specific, either the elements composed, con excuse me, contained within the sample or how those elements are bound to one another to give molecular, so structural information. And then the last step is actually, is a technique called a thermal susceptibility test. That's literally taking a small amount of material, introducing heat in the form of flame, and then seeing how it reacts. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gillette, did you take any photographs as part of your examination in this case? Yes, I took multiple photographs using um, one of our microscopes. Great. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Gillette, would you please look at these two photographs and tell me that these are photographs uh, that you took as part of your laboratory testing? Yes, I took both of the photographs. Great. Your Honor, Mr. Bowles and I have stipulated um, to the admission of States exhibits 111A and 111B. Um, may I move for entry of those and request to publish? Yes. Maybe. Thank you. All right. Mr. Gillette, let's start with this image. Are you able to see that on your monitor? Not at the moment, no. Okay. Let's fix that. No. Oh, there it is. All right. Mr. De Mr. De did you take this photograph? Yes, I did. And what is this a photograph of? This is a photograph of a handful of the particles from item four. All right. Um, when, you, when you say item four, can you explain what item four is? Uh, item four is one of the samples that I received with respect to this case. Um, what was the form of item four? What do you mean by four? Was it a was it a cartridge of live ammunition? It was a disassembled cartridge. Um, I don't recall specifically every single component within the container that contained item four, but I was focused on the suspected ammunition propellant. Great. And did you um, did you examine some other items that had a smokeless powder that looked just like this? Yes, I did. And what were those items? Those would have been items four through seven, and um, there was a fifth one. I don't recall the item number. Would it help you refresh your recollection if you look at your report? Yes, it would. Please take a look at your report. Okay. Do you, do you now know what the fifth item was? Yes, it was item 13-1. All right. And do you know where, where these items were sourced from? Uh, specifically, I don't recall the sources for every single item, but it was either from a cart, a bandolier, a holster, and I believe a tray. Okay. And all five of these uh, items, they have this identical smokeless powder composition in them. Is that correct? Well, they have that, this physical appearance. Right. And the shape and size and color. Okay, great. Now I'd like to show you what has been marked as State's Exhibit 111B. What can you tell me about this photograph? This is another photograph I took using a microscope. This is item 24-1. All right, and, and what does this picture show? The appearance and the physical characteristics, what we call the morphology, the shape, size, color of, the, of this specific powder. And did you examine more than one item that had this type of powder? Yes, I did. There were six that had this morphology. And, and do you know what the source of those six items was? Uh, the source? Where, oh. where they were found? Is, uh, I recall in one of the uh, laboratory examination requests that received, the source wasn't specifically a location for um, two of them. It was a name. And then 
Um, the others had a, a street address in Albuquerque. Do you recall what the name was? I believe the name was Seth Kenny. And, and do you recall the address? The specific address? No, I think it was Monroe Street in, in Albuquerque. Okay, great. What I'd like to do now, and, and before I do this, all six of the cartridges that you, or the disassembled cartridges, um, that were either identified from as coming from Seth Kinney or from the Monroe Street address have smokeless powder that looks like this. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. All right. Now I'd like to put these kind of side to side. And, and if you can, I know that it's kind of obvious, but could you explain to the jurors kind of what some of the visual differences between these uh, two different types of smokeless powders are? They both have generically the same shape, we would call that disc shaped. However, the ones on the left are slightly smaller and they're darker in color. The ones on the right are slightly larger and have a single perforation. Great. Um, aside from their visual appearance, did you conduct any testing to see if they were different chemically? Yes, I conducted the, excuse me, conducted the explosives chemistry examinations that um, identified them both as smokeless powders but with different chemical constituents. And for those on the left, what were your conclusions? The items on the left were identified as a double base smokeless powder. And for the right? A single base smokeless powder. Both They were both disc shaped but the ones on the right were obviously they had a single perforation. All right. And what sort of conclusions are you able to draw from both the visual analysis and your chemical analysis between these two different types of smokeless powders? Between the two, they are both physically and chemically different from one another. All right. Is it, uh, is it, is it, uh, is it fair to say that these probably came from two different manufacturers? Oh, I, I couldn't say that because one manufacturer might make a whole bunch of different types of smokeless powder. Sure, understandable. All right, I'll pass the witness. Clock 16. Good afternoon, Mr. Gillette. Good afternoon. So, the, the number of items you tested in this case, you, that was 11 different items, right? Correct. Okay. And these items that you tested were all cartridges that were given to you by Santa Fe, by law enforcement, right? No, specifically, I didn't test any cartridges. It was the suspected ammunition propellant. But you received cartridges? I received, yes, I did. Um, and your role in this was not to make sure that... Um, like I guess what I'm trying to say is you had no role in selecting which cartridges um, or which um, powders you were going to test, right? You, you tested what they gave you. Correct. Um, and you received, is it true, it's the form you received them in um, was 11 Ziploc bags, right? Yes, I believe they were zipper, zipper lock style bags. And each of the bags had a bullet, a casing, and a screw top container with some powder in it. Is that right? I believe that's what it was. Okay. So then when you received these items, these cartridges, they, they weren't intact. That is correct. They were not intact. The powder was already removed out. That is correct. And do you know who removed the powder out? No, I do not. Okay. Um, now, FBI laboratory, that's where you said you worked on direct, um, are you aware of a Mr. Ziegler that works in FBI laboratory as well? Yes, Bryce Ziegler was the assigned examiner in the firearms and tool marks unit. Okay, and was he the one who had these um, items um, prior to you testing them? I believe so, yes. Uh, and you don't know if, if Mr. Ziegler is the one that removed the powder or if somebody else removed the powder? I'm not certain that it was Mr. Ziegler. I would assume that it was him. Okay. Um, so you can't say if the powder from these cartridges um, was just was all of it there or if it was just part of the powder from the cartridges, if it was just a sampling. You, you don't have no way of knowing that, right? I No, I do not. So you don't know if the powder actually came. In, in addition, you don't know if the powder actually came from the particular cartridge that it was in, in parts in the Ziploc either. It could have come from a different one. Well, since I didn't 
disassemble them specifically? No, I can't say that where they specifically came from. Right. And um, your testing, you, you talked about the source of the 11 items you got um, being part of them from an individual named Seth Kinney, right? Correct, yes. Hey. That's, I should say that's what was on one of the communications that we got. It's also on your report, right? Or is it not on your report? I don't recall it being on the report. Okay. Um, so you have, do you have any idea where Seth, Seth Kinney got these rounds from? No. Um, do you know how it is that Seth Kinney selected these specific rounds to provide to law enforcement to provide to you? I don't know that he even provided them to law enforcement. You just know they came from him, right? I just know that in the income, one of the incoming communications we had, his name was stated as the uh, either the source or where it was collected. Okay. Um, what about the timing? Do you know when these rounds that, that indicate they come from Seth Kinney, do you know when those rounds came from Seth Kinney? If it was a month after the shooting, a day, two months, do you have any idea? Uh, there would have been a date associated with that laboratory examination request, that incoming communication, so I could maybe assume around a specific time, but specifically now. Okay, well, your report, um, your report was dated May 3rd, 2012, right? 2020. I mean, 2022. Yeah. May 3rd, 2022. That sounds correct. Okay. And, um... Mr. Ziegler or somebody else had already disassembled these items um, did, before you got them, right? So you know... Yes, they were disassembled before I got them. So did you review Mr. Ziegler's report to determine when they were submitted to him? No, I did not. Okay. But you would have received these items after Mr. Ziegler then, right? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Um, and... It, isn't it true that you're not actually able to tell us whether two powders that you receive are from different, if the two powders from different locations actually originated from the same source? What do you mean by source? Um, like if they're from the same source of um, a cartridge. No, I, I couldn't specifically... I can just say what, what I received and what my examination results were. Well, but you can't say that they originated from the same source. You can only say that they're consistent, right? If I was performing a, if I was trying to associate two things together, like um, comparing two things together, but in this case, they both of the, or the two powders within this submission, they were physically and chemically distinct from one another. So they wouldn't be able to be from the same source. Well, but you, right, well, but you, you have a way to, um, uh, you can only say that they're consistent. You can't say that they are from the same source. Oh, if, if, say, that these two powders were not different, both physically and chemically, the best I could say then was that they are physically and chemically consistent with one another, if that were even the case, which is not the way it is. Now I've seen, um, so it appears that there were several um, cartridges that were sent to the FBI laboratory for testing beyond the 11, um, and, and I just want to make sure you don't have an, a different, uh, an additional report, or you didn't test any of the other cartridges that went to the FBI lab other than these 11? That's correct. I was only given 11 samples to examine. Okay. Um, and. So it seems like the purpose of your work is to determine whether there's smokeless powder present, right? Well, the, I would say the purpose is to determine whether or not the suspected ammunition propellant is ammunition propellant. And, and that would be one type of ammunition propellant is smokeless powder that you're looking for, right? Correct. Okay. And you used, in order to do that, you used this whole scientific process you just talked about on direct. Um, to determine whether these were live rounds, right? You actually had to look at the chemical composition of the powder in order to tell the difference, right? No, I, I never made a determination as to whether or not something was a live round. From my explosives chemistry examinations, I determined whether or not they were explosives, specifically 
ammunition propellant, specifically smokeless powder. Right, but in order to do that, you actually had to do a chemical composition of the powder to tell the difference, right? Correct. And the technique that you had to do to, to do that um, is, and you were trying to tell if, if this um, it was, I think you said, what, visual microscopic inspection first, right? Correct. And then uh, you also did a thermal susceptibility test. Correct. And then infrared, uh, like spectro... Spectroscopy. Uh, yeah, but the the spectroscopic techniques? Correct. Is that what... Okay. And then um, the there was one more. It was the gas chromatography. Is that right? Correct. All right. So that sounds very scientific here. These tests are all done in a li laboratory, right? Correct. And in order... And that is the way that you determine if this powder is, in fact... An ammunition propellant is this all scientific in the lab kind of stuff correct by following the specific technical procedure that we have and your procedure also produced over a hundred pages of notes didn't it um, not specifically notes I would say case notes they were probably shorter than that maybe a dozen or so but all of the instrument data definitely over a hundred pages all right um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to you were asked some questions about the manufacturer um, and it, isn't it true that it's it's um, actually possible to determine the brand of a powder? It, if there's enough identifying dis physical and chemical characteristics, it potentially could be possible, yes. Okay, and that's actually, that's something that you are able to perform, but you weren't asked to do that in this case? No, we weren't asked to do that. In fact, um, does the FBI have a standard operating procedure for smokeless powder analysis um, that discusses brand determination? Um, not specifically brand determination, but trying to um, find a specific type of smokeless powder, yes. Are you saying there's no FBI SOP that, no, I've, that I've, talks brand determination? I'd, I don't recall specifically brand determination being in it, but maybe it is. But there is, there are ways, and we do even have a database of several hundred different smokeless powders. But we are that we could compare results to, but we weren't asked to do that. And um, sort of as you alluded to, it's it's very very hard to say that two things are the same. Technically, we it would be very very hard for us to say these two powders are these. A specific type of brand, but if there were enough physical and chemical distinct characteristics within them that we could hopefully at best narrow it down to a brand and maybe like a, a line of products. Right, and, and in fact what you just said with the FBI's laboratory having a um, database with smokeless powders that can assist in brand name determination, that's in the SOP, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Um, but you weren't asked to go through that database in this case, or to do that? No, there was no request to try to determine the specific manufacturer. Okay. Um, so let's talk about, uh, I think you also took some measurements, right, of the diameter of the particles? Correct. Um, and the purpose of that, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's um, you can, in taking the diameter, you can compare the similarities and differences of the diameters, um, right? That's, yes. That's a purpose. Um, but in this case, you weren't asked to perform an associations analysis? Oh, we don't have an associations analysis. Okay. But we could, I did differentiate between the, the two different types of, types of powders that were identified. Right, but, but in terms of, um, of actually comparing them, let's, let's talk about the weighing. The, the, you didn't weigh the powder, right? No, I did not. Okay. And that would be another way, would you agree, to differentiate um, the, the different particles by weighing it? But by how one specific particle weighs? Right. Yes. So, uh, and so you don't know from because you didn't weigh them, I guess, if these were partially full or completely full, the cartridges when the powder was in them. Oh no, I didn't. I didn't do any sort of weight um, examination. No. But wouldn't weight tell you um, weighing the powder would tell you how much was in the cartridge, right? 
Yes, in terms of weight, yes. Uh, now, I think we were talking a little bit about timeline earlier. I think you said that your work in this case, um, your report was dated in May of 2022, but your work is actually done in like April of 2022. Is that right? Correct. I believe I started in April of 2022. And how soon would you start? I, I mean, you can tell me, can you extrapolate from that? If you started your work in April, did your report in May when these items were received by you? By me, I would have to look at the chain of custody. Okay. Would it be close to April of 2022? I would expect it to be April of 2022. Okay. So you weren't provided with these until April of 2022? I, I would have to look at the chain of custody to be certain, but I believe I received them in April of 2022. All right. And um, I mean, you, you said you're, you're the chemist, you, you did all the tests here, but you have no personal knowledge about where these were on October 21st of 2021, right? Correct. Just a second. Pass the witness. Redirect. Mr. Gillette, does the FBI and your lab in particular have procedures and policies in place that discuss cross-contamination of evidence? Objection, you're outside the scope. She asked him. I never asked about cross-contamination. Overruled. Go ahead and answer. Yes, we do. Uh, can you describe those policies and procedures to the jury, please? Specifically within the explosives unit, we... Um, minimize, reduce, and eliminate cross-contamination um, a number of different ways. When we start our examinations wherever we're working, um, we don't clean PPE, so lab coat, gloves, um, safety glasses, but we have to clean our work surface typically with um, isopropanol, so rubbing alcohol, and then put down clean butcher paper so that the surface we're working on is clean and not contaminated, and that we um, Anytime we handle a different sample, we either do that, change our gloves, just you know those sort of procedures to make sure we're not introducing anything into the sample that isn't part of the sample. Do you ever work on two samples at the same time? Yes. In what circumstances would you work on two samples at the same time? Or I can contain them and keep them separated from one another. Okay. Nothing further. All right. Excuse. Thank you, sir. Next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Jerry Lynn Conway. Can you approach? that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, thank you. Have a seat talking to the microphone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. Great. Uh, would you please state your name for the record? Yes, my name is Geraldine Conway. It's spelled J-E-R-R-I-L-Y-N. C-O-N-W-A-Y. And what's your current occupation? I'm a DNA examiner in the DNA casework unit at the FBI laboratory. And what are some of your responsibilities as a DNA examiner? As an examiner, I basically manage a case. When a case comes to our unit for DNA testing, I determine what testing we're gonna do on that on that on those items of evidence and then a team of biologists will do the testing for that case i'll review the results of the, that test i'll determine if more tests need to be conducted and then i'll do comparisons and write a report and then testify as needed great tell us about your educational background i have a bachelor's of science in genetics from texas a m university 
and a Master's of Science in Molecular Biology from New Mexico State University. And prior to working at the FBI, uh, what kind of experience did you have? I worked in a genetics lab at New Mexico State University working on cotton genetics testing. Great. And you may have already said I missed it. How long have you been working at the FBI? I've been there since 2000, so almost 24 years. Great. And um, have you attended any specialized training uh, for the position you currently hold at the FBI? I did. I, I went through about a two-year training program. I took moot court examinations so that I could be sure to be able to explain my results to, to a group of, um, of, a juror, of jury, jurors. Um, and then I also took oral board examinations in the fields of serology, genetics, and statistics. Great. Um, and have you ever been recognized by a court previously as an expert witness in this field? I have, yes. Great. You already moved that the court recognized Ms. Conway as an expert witness in the field of forensic serology and DNA analysis. <coughs> What's your name? No objection. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm what so admitted, I don't want to have to repeat that when I <laughs> sneezed and couldn't hear some of it. Um, uh, forensic serology and DNA analysis. Right, thank you, admitted. All right, thank you. Um, what is forensic serology? Forensic serology is the identification of body fluids such as blood on items of evidence. And how do you perform serological examination on items of evidence? When a biologist looks at an item of evidence, they'll look for areas of staining. So those areas of staining then will be tested with chemicals. Um, a small portion of that stain will be swabbed using a, a swab is like a Q-tip with just the cotton on one end. That moistened Q-tip will be used to sample a small portion of that stain. And then chemicals will be added to that swab and, and a color change will be expected. If it's positive, that means that blood might be present on that item, it's considered a presumptive test, and if it's negative, then then blood was not detected on that item. Great. And can you give us a, just a general description of what, what exactly is DNA? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it acts as our genetic blueprint. We inherit our DNA from our parents. We get half from our mo mother and half from our father, and we so we basically have two copies of our DNA. And uh, where is DNA found? DNA is found in our cells, and our cells are the building blocks of our bodies. And if you think of a cell like an egg, then the yolk of the egg, we, we call that the nucleus. And the nuclear DNA is what we test um, in our forensic testing. And how can DNA be used to differ differentiate between different individuals? Most of our DNA is the same. However, there is a small portion that is different among us. Some of those portions are tested in our forensic testing, and those portions are called STRs, which stands for short tandem repeats. These repeats are pieces of DNA that are repeated over and over. When we do DNA testing, we determine how many repeats an individual has in their DNA, and then we're able to look at those areas that differ among inv individuals. Can you describe for the jury, how, what's the procedure that you use to develop a DNA type? The procedure goes through a step-by-step -step process in the laboratory. And when the, so when the biologist sees that there's a stain to be tested, then they can either cut that stain or they might use another swab to swab a portion of that stain. That stain or that swab will be cut and put into a tube that's barcoded and then moves through the rest of the process. After it's collected, then it's extracted, and extraction just means that the DNA is purified away from the rest of, of the material, so the material it was collected on, and then any other cellular material that might be present. The next step is quantitation, where the, the, a portion of that sample is put into an instrument to determine how much DNA is present in that sample. And then a portion of the sample is taken based on that quantitation to the next step, which is amplification. The amplification means that there are pieces, those pieces that we're interested in, those STRs, are amplified so that they can be detected in an instrument. So after the amplification is complete, then a small portion of that sample is moved onto an instrument to separate it out by size. After it's sized, then I can look at that, that resulting data and determine the DNA profile from that sample. And what's a reference sample? 
A reference sample is a sample from an individual, and we know whose DNA that is. So it goes through all of the same processes to get a DNA profile at the end. But in this case, I know whose DNA is present in that sample, and I can use it for a comparison. Great. And, and what does a DNA profile look like? A DNA profile basically looks like peaks on a graph, so that instrument that separates it out by size, when those pieces move through that instrument, then they are recorded by the instrument. And then I can look at that data. Basically, we look at 21 different locations to determine a person's DNA profile. Those 21 different locations have results at those locations which end up just being numbers. And remember, we get half of our DNA from mom and half from dad, which means that at any given location, a person might have one result, which means they got the same number of repeats from mom and dad, or they have two results, so they get two different numbers of repeats from mom and dad. And what is a mixed uh, profile? So a mixed DNA profile means that more than one person's DNA is detected on the sample that is that has been analyzed. And I can tell that it's a mixture when I see more than two results at any of those locations that I test. So after you develop a profile, what's your next step in terms of how do you do your comparison? So my next step is to look at the DNA types from the reference sample, from someone whose DNA I know it came from, and compare that to the sample that I got from the evidence. When I do that comparison, I might have enough information that I can exclude that person outright. If I can, then I will do that. If not, then I'll use a statistical program to assess how common or rare the DNA types are in the sample, and also could this person be a contributor to that DNA profile. So aside from that, what other conclusions can you draw from a comparison? So once I have once I'm, I've used my statistical analysis, I have um, a result that's called a likelihood ratio. This likelihood ratio is basically a comparison of two different explanations for the DNA evidence. One explanation is that the person who I'm comparing to is a contributor to that profile. And the other explanation is that person is not a contributor, and rather an unknown, unrelated person is a contributor to that evidence. How do you calculate the significance of a match? That likelihood ratio gives me a number, and that number, the higher it is, the, the, the more support I have for one of those explanations over the other. So remember, if the likelihood ratio is high, then the explanation that that person is a contributor is more supported than the explanation that that person is not a contributor. And do you do any uh, sort of ongoing testing to make sure that your results are reliable? I know that my results are reliable because our laboratory goes through um, there's a number of quality assurance procedures that are in place at the laboratory. We use controls to ensure that the results we use a positive control to show that our tests are working and we get an expected result from a positive control. And then we also use negative controls to ensure that we have no contamination in our, in our reagents or chemicals that we use. We also, our biologists are highly trained. They're qualified to do the work and they also wear personal protective equipment. They wear lab coats, they wear gloves, they wear masks and goggles to ensure that they don't contaminate the evidence they're working on either. Thank you. Ms. Conway, how did you become involved in this case? So this case was submitted to the DNA casework unit and it was and then I determined that the, that the samples in this case needed to go through testing, and that testing was then conducted by the biologist. Following that testing, I then reviewed those results and wrote the report. And exactly what sort of testing were you asked, asked to perform? We did both serology and DNA testing in this case. All right. And what was the item that you tested? We tested a revolver. All right. I'm going to show you what's been previously marked as States Exhibit 9. Uh, is your uh, monochrome over there? It is. All right. Does this appear to be a photograph of the uh, revolver that you performed your testing on? It does. Okay, great. Um, 
Was your lab able to detect and obtain a usable DNA reference sample from this revolver? We obtained a profile from a sample that was taken from the revolver, yes. Okay. And did you have comparators to check the reference sample against? We compared this to four reference samples that were submitted in this case. And do you know who those four are? Yes, I do. We got a reference sample from Alexander Baldwin, a reference sample from Hannah Gutierrez, a reference sample from David Halls, and a reference sample from Sarah Zachary. And, and what were the results of your comparisons? Were you able to include or exclude any of these reference individuals? Yes, for each of those individuals I developed a likelihood ratio and the likelihood ratio um, is, is different for each person. So the likelihood ratio for Mr. Baldwin the DNA results from the sample from the revolver are 110,000 times more likely if Mr. Baldwin and two unknown unrelated individuals are contributors to that sample rather than if three unknown unrelated individuals are contributors to that sample. And with regard to Ms. Gutierrez, what, what were your findings? With regard to Ms. Gutierrez, the DNA results from that sample from the revolver are equally likely if Ms. Gutierrez and two unknown unrelated individuals are contributors to that sample rather than if three unknown unrelated individuals are contributors to that sample. This means that the DNA analysis was, the likelihood ratio was one and that DNA analysis was uninformative. Okay, so is it fair to say you can't say for sure whether Ms. Gutierrez handled this gun. I can't say for sure whether her DNA was detected in the sample that I analyzed. Okay, That's thank right. you. That's fair. Um, I, I want to change gears a little bit and I want to talk to you now about the test, DNA testing of cartridge casings. Um, what can you tell the jury about the FBI policy of testing cartridge casings? The policy at the FBI is to not conduct DNA testing on cartridge casings. And why is that? There's a limited chance that DNA would be obtained from those cartridge casings, especially if they have been fired. The heat um, from a the heat from firing a weapon is significant enough that DNA can be very degraded and broken down from that from that heat. And, and is the policy the same even if the cartridge hasn't been fired? That's right. It's not our policy to test cartridge casings. Okay. So if the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office had sent you some casings to test, what would you have done with those? We would not have tested them. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. Thank you, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, are you saying that the FBI policy is never to test cartridges for DNA? Our general policy is to not test them, that's right. Our general policy, so does that mean it, it ever happens? I believe it has happened in some cases, but our policy is to not accept those cases. Okay, well, for example, a terrorism case comes through. Very important right, ter terrorism case is presented to you. They say, we need you to test cartridges for DNA. Has something like that ever happened at the FBI? I'm not aware specifically of a case where they have been tested. Okay, but you are aware that the FBI can do that. They have the capability to test cartridges for DNA. It's possible to test them, yes, but there's a number of reasons that we do not, and our case acceptance is to not test them. Okay, and the allocation of resources, whatever that may be, but you can do that as a unit, as the FBI. You're not telling the jury the FBI can't test rounds for DNA, are you? Testing, testing for DNA requires that a sample in our lab would be swabbed and that would also destroy any latent fingerprints that might be present and so our policy is to leave those, leave those samples for latent fingerprints. Okay, so you would prefer latent fingerprints be collected from those? Perhaps. Okay, now in this case you received four names, uh, four DNA buckle swabs I did. And a buckle swab for the jury, it just is that inside your... It's a cheek swab from the inside of your cheek. Okay, and that gets the DNA that you can use later for the comparison. <clears throat> That's right. Okay, now you did not receive Seth Kenny buckle swab, did you? I did not. Okay, and you did not receive anybody else other than those four individuals? That's correct. And so your primary conclusion in this case was that Baldwin likely touched the revolver, correct? 
My primary conclusion is that the DNA that I tested um, supports the inclusion of Mr. Baldwin as a contributor to that DNA, yes. Okay. And the other part I didn't quite understand, the three unknown contributors, but the bottom line is the likelihood he touched it. Obviously, he said he did. His DNA is consistent with the DNA that I found on the okay. gun, yes. Okay, thank you. Nothing further. All right. Thank you. You're excused. Thank you. Sure. We're going to take a five minute break on conferring. I think it's easier if you just stay here instead of transported back and forth, but certainly stand, stretch, drink some water. We're not going to stand for you though, for now.
Affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, Your Honor. All right, have a seat talking to the microphone. Go ahead and state your name for the record, please. Ross Adiego. Spell your last name, if you would. A-D-D-I-E-G-O. Mr. Adiego, how are you currently employed? Uh, as a dolly, uh, dolly grip. Can you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what a dolly grip does? I um, help the camera department um, in any way possible with camera support. So any camera movement, whether on a dolly, camera cranes, um, rigging a camera to vehicles, I assist them in, in any way that I can as a representative from the grip department. You do this on movie sets? Um, movie sets, television sets, music videos, commercials, yes. Um, give us a little bit of an idea uh, of your uh, background and experience in the film industry. How long have you been working as a dolly grip or generally kind of as camera supportive crew? Um, I've been in the industry um, almost 30 years at this point. And when we talk about film credits, tell, tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what we mean when we say film credits. Um, on a TV show, we wouldn't often be listed at the end of the show. On a movie, you would see credits roll at the end of a movie. Um, but online, there's a, a database, um, internet uh, movie database, that kind of tracks um, not only uh, the productions, the shows, um, the actors, and also the crew, which I would fall under. Um, so that essentially acts as a resume for me. And on that uh, online database, approximately how many film credits do you have? Um, over a hundred. And would you say that, that over a hundred is approximately the number of film credits that you really have? <laughs> um, I would say that that represents half of my time on set. Um, certain things don't get, a lot of commercials don't get listed, music videos don't get listed. Uh, most of my TV and film work, I think, is on there. Okay. Uh, so your total amount of credits might be closer to 200? Uh, that's probably a safe assessment, yes. Okay. And um, back in October of 2021, uh, were you, how were you employed? I was employed as uh, the A-camera dolly grip on a little movie called Rust. So... When you say a camera, are, is there more than one camera? When we, yes, that movie had two cameras, an A camera and a B camera. And is that common? It is very much common, yes. Um, have you ever worked on films that have more than two cameras? Yes. And have you worked on films that had only one camera? Yes. So as the A camera dolly grip, can, can you just kind of... Walk us through what you're doing on set. Um, uh, in the simplest terms, helping the uh, director of photography um, capture the uh, director and writer's vision for the project. And specifically, how are you doing that? Physically, what are you doing? Um, uh, again, assisting with the camera movement um, on this movie, we had a good number of uh, crane shots, so high and wide, to see the western town or the beautiful environment we were in, um, a lot of dolly moves, so there was uh, constantly movement throughout um, uh, the story, whether moving into a set or coming out of a set to, re to reveal other characters. So what's the dolly and what is the dolly used for? 
Um, the dolly is a piece of uh, camera support equipment um, used in lieu of a tripod or another uh, stable or static um, camera support uh, apparatus. So the dolly typically has eight wheels, different size dollies uh, depending on the project, and it also has a um, uh, hydraulic boom system so I can uh, with my controls boom the camera up and down whether during the shot or or to set up a shot and get the camera where both the director of photography and the camera operator and the director think it best tells the story we're trying to tell in that moment and who was the director of photography for this film Helena Hutchins and who was the director for this film uh, Joel Souza and do you recall was the camera operator for camera A always the same person? Um, un until the fateful day, uh, it was the same person. And who was that person? Um, his name was Andy. Uh, his last name escapes me at this moment. Okay. Um, in this film, was camera A always on a dolly? Uh, no. So other than the camera filming from the dolly, how else can cameras film? Um, we did a, a good bit of handheld. Um, so my cameraman would have the camera on his shoulder by his hip and I would assist him with that uh, weight and keeping him safe as he's moving around. And let me um, stop you right there. Yes. Approximately how much does that camera weigh? On that project it was depending on the lens, 40-ish pounds. Okay, go ahead, sir. Um, and then we also um, had Andy on a uh, man-rideable crane, which means that I could put him on a camera crane that was 20-some-odd feet long or longer and kind of put him up in the air to get um, uh, wide vistas of our sets and locations. So... How long had filming been going on on the set of Rust uh, prior to October 21st? Um, we were a couple of weeks into it. And when you say a couple of weeks, um, uh, are we talking uh, uh, how many days are in the work week? I, I, my recollection is we were doing five day weeks, but at some point our weeks shifted. I think we were doing a, a Tuesday through Saturday schedule, so we were 10 to 12 days in, I believe, at that point. Okay, 10 to 12 days of actual filming. Correct. Okay, because you had weekends. Uh, we did. We typically had uh, whatever our union protocol was, two days off, 48 okay. hours or some, some such. Um, now, with regard to all of your um, film credits, can you tell the, the jury approximately how many projects you've worked on uh, where there was an armorer on the crew? Can't give you an exact number, but a uh, dozen or more at this point in my career. And why would a production company hire an armorer? Um, because they plan to use uh, potentially deadly weapons and ammunition. And what is your understanding of what the responsibilities of a set armor are? You want me on the Anybody approach on this? Sure. Mr. Diego, based on your experience working on films with armorers, do you know what the armorer is responsible for? Yes. Can you tell us? Um, 
my understanding of the armor's responsibilities is any working firearms and any ammunition is under their control. And when you say that working firearms and ammunition are under your control, um, are under their control, let me ask you, in your experience, are there certain industry protocols that are followed on movie sets by armorers? Yes. Your Honor, I'm going to object again to lack of foundation. I'm going to sustain that objection. You've testified that you have worked on 12 movie sets with armorers. Is that correct? It is correct. 12 or more? At least 12. Has that experience made you familiar with what you believe are the industry protocols for armorers on movie sets? Your Honor, get on object. Sounds good. Approach. Mr. Odiego, in the films that you worked on where there was an armorer, and for the purposes of this question, we're excluding the movie Rust, did you notice certain safety protocols that you yourself saw armorers engage in in all of those movies up until you got to the movie Rust? Yes. So I'd like to talk to you about those. In the other movies where there were armorers that you worked on, can you describe for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury How, uh, uh, under what circumstances in your experience can you describe the safety protocols that the armorers on those other movies engaged in when they would bring a firearm onto set for use in filming a scene? Your Honor, I'm also going to object to relevance. What happened on other movies has no relevance to what happened on Rust. Response. Can we approach? Sure.
All right, Mr. Adiego, let's proceed. Do you recall the question? Uh, if you give it to me again, please. Walk us through your experience with safety protocols uh, by film set armorers when the armorer brings a weapon onto set to be used in the filming of a scene prior to your experience on the set of rest. Uh, my experience has been that uh, typically the armorers would have some sort of uh, safety meeting or lecture um, before any of uh, firearms are going to be used in the filming of a scene. Uh, and let me, I'm going to stop you right there. In terms of the safety meeting, who is the person on set in your experience who usually calls for the safety meeting? Uh, the first assistant director. And that would not be Ms. Gutierrez? Uh, no, it would not. Who was the first assistant director in this case? Uh, the first assistant director on Rust is uh, Dave Halls. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned one of the first things that happens is there is a safety meeting. Uh, typically we would discuss, uh, I guess I should back up, typically when we receive um, our call sheets, uh, an email call sheet the night prior to filming. Okay, hang on just a second because I don't know that we have very many people here that are in the film industry. What's a call sheet? Um, so I would receive an email typically receive an email every night before filming and that email would include um, a call sheet that would list um, who will be on set both cast and crew it'll tell us what scenes we're doing it'll tell us locations kind of general information for the day um, weather what time the sun goes up and down whatever um, production uh, feels is pertinent information and then a lot of times what they'll attach to that email are um, the sides the actual parts of the script we're shooting for the day and then safety bulletins whatever union um, safety bulletins would be appropriate for that day, whether firearms or animals, uh, inclement weather. Um, and then on the day of filming, uh, typically the first assistant director would call for um, a safety meeting and call all of the cast and crew that would be involved to listen to that meeting. And potentially the armor may have something to say uh, as far as um, what we're doing if we're firing blanks. Here's the... But hang on, I'm going to stop you right there. Um, so hypothetically, if, this, if the scene calls for the firing of blanks, because we haven't had a lot of this testimony in trial yet, mm -hmm. can you explain to the jurors what your understanding is about uh, the difference in the different loads of blanks? Uh, in my experience, the, uh, the armor would tell us if we're using dummies or blanks, and if we're using blanks, which would make a noise in a flash, they would typically describe the power. Um, quarter load, half load, full load would give us some indication as to uh, the potential uh, danger with that particular um, firearm being used by the actor in that scene. And let me, let me stop you right there. You talked about the particular danger. Um, can blanks be dangerous on a movie set? My understanding is they can, yes. And are there certain, is there certain safety gear uh, that some crew members may use if there is going to be the firing of blanks in their uh, immediate proximity. Yes. And can you explain to the to, to the jurors uh, what that would be, in your experience? Certainly. Um, uh, the very basic. Um Personal protective equipment we would use would, at the very least, be safety glasses and some form of hearing protection. Hearing protection, pardon me. Um, but sometimes it may be uh, covering the camera operators that may be in jeopardy with special coats um, to deflect anything coming out of those firearms. We may protect the camera and the lens with uh, special acrylics like Lexan bulletproof glass essentially so um, yes we would take certain precautions 
Is that the reason that it's important for you to know what size blank is going to be used? Yes. And with regard to dummies, go, go ahead and, and continue to kind of walk us through how this would work. So uh, t typically, uh, depending on the firearms being used, in this case it was a Western, so a lot of the firearms were older Western style um, six guns where you would see if the gun was potentially loaded or not. Um, and sometimes that may simply mean loaded with a dummy round. So if the camera saw uh, the front of the firearm, um, the audience would think that it was absolutely a loaded firearm, but um, the dummy rounds typically for us as the crew um, are, are different than the blanks in that they may appear as though they're a, a real um, bullet, but they would typically have a hole drilled in them or the primer at the end that would ignite that bullet would be removed or already be uh, pushed in. Um, and then sometimes the dummies, um, depending on how they're being used in the film, you can't make holes in them. So what the, uh, I guess the props people that make them put a little BB in there. So the armor can shake that dummy and you would hear a little BB rattle in there. And that's supposed to let us know that that um, particular bullet or round is safe. So... Is this the information that you would receive at a safety meeting? Um, both at a safety meeting and I believe some of this is stated in the, the um, safety bulletins put out by IOTSI. And what is IOTSI? Uh, uh, IOTSI is the union we m most filmmakers belong to. It's um, International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. And do actors also belong to IOTSI? Uh, typically, no. Do they have their own union? They, I believe they refer to it as a guild, but they would be the Screen Actors Guild is what the actors typically belong to, yes. Is IOTSI the union for crew members as opposed to cast? It is, yes. Okay. Um, now, the, the call sheet and the email and the safety bulletin that you've referred to, in your experience, who provides that to, to the, the cast and crew? Is it the armor? I know that's generated by production. It's someone in, in production would okay. generate that and uh, get it out to us, in any, whether it's an email or given to us on set. So Ms. Gutierrez wouldn't have been responsible for that? Not in my, no, not, okay. not with what I know. And you indicated that in terms of safety meetings, the safety meetings are called by the assistant director and not the armorer, is that correct? That is correct. Um, with regard to safety bulletins, was there a difference between the way that safety bulletins were handled on the set of Rust and the way that safety bulletins were handled on the other films you participated in that had firearms and armorers. Yes. Tell us the difference. So in those emails that I referred to earlier, um, it typically would say, please, you know, would ask us to please refer to uh, the appropriate safety bulletins, and then they would list the number of that bulletin, and then in that email, I'd be able to click on a link if I so chose to review that bulletin. Um, I don't recall any of those bulletins actually being attached to our um, emails during Rust. You don't recall ever getting a single one? I don't recall ever receiving a safety bulletin from Rust Productions, no. Let's jump to safety meetings. Um, on the other sets that you worked on that had guns and armorers, how frequently would a safety meeting occur? Um, at least once a day, if not more frequently. And on the set of Rust, how frequently did safety meetings occur? I don't know that I was invited to more than one. 
during our couple of weeks on Rust. So for the entire two weeks, you only were, were you are only aware of one safety meeting. That's my recollection. Yes. Okay. So we've talked about safety bulletins and safety meetings. Go ahead and continue to walk us through, um, in your experience, the protocol of an armor with firearms. Um, in my experience, the, the armors are usually the, uh, well, for lack of a better description, the most um, uptight and anal retentive people on set because they literally have people's lives in their hands. Um, they don't joke around. They don't really have friendly conversations. They stick to themselves and um, focus on the task at hand. Um, most of them, in my experience, seem to be either former military or law enforcement and have some sort of background with firearms. Um, did you notice a, a difference then generally in terms of just the um, behavior, the general behavior on the movie set of the other armors you worked with as compared to Ms. Gutierrez? Uh, yes. What was that? Um, she wasn't necessarily as uh, serious or professional as I'm accustomed to with the other armors that I've worked with. What do you mean? Give us an example. Um, I recall walking by her uh, cart a number of times and firearms and or uh, bandoliers or ammo belts being left out on the cart uh, unsecured. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen an armor pull loose ammo out of a fanny pack. Typically, my experience with armors is um, any ammo they use, blanks or dummies comes out of some sort of container, whether it's a labeled box or um, some other plastic type ammo container. So. Um, now, in terms of you, you indicated that you would see uh, firearms and gun belts unattended on the cart. Um, why was that? Why did that stand out to you? It, it was out of the ordinary. Um, again, my experience is, is most of the firearms I've seen on set come out of some sort of locked bag, locked container. Um, the armor, some armors, depending on the show, have a whole uh, wheel around cart with drawers that they can lock, uh, a drawer that potentially has the individual actors uh, or character's name on that drawer. Um, so that character's props would live in that drawer under lock and key. Were the guns and gun belts laying out unattended on the prop cart, was that a safety concern for you? Yes. Why? Uh, it seemed inappropriate and out of the ordinary um, that those firearms weren't secured. And why is it concerning that the firearms aren't secured? Um, well, I don't know that they're completely under the armor's control if they're not under lock and key. And what's your understanding of whether those firearms that you saw unattended, were they fake guns or were they real guns? Um, my understanding, uh, most of the prop firearms we had on Rust were actual um, working firearms, so. Okay. Now, based on your experience, just generally, what is the armor responsible for? Your Honor, again, this is expert testimony. He's a camera operator, and he's asking to give expert testimony on what armor is for. He's not, sorry. This is based upon his personal experience only, and as long as it stays there, it's fine. Go ahead, sir. Um, if you don't mind the question again, please. Um, what is your understanding, based on your experience, of the armorer's responsibilities on a movie set? Um, 
to control and keep safe all um, firearms and ammunition on on a given set. Okay. Go ahead and, and walk us through, if you will, what what in your experience uh, are the safety checks that take place when an armorer is bringing a firearm onto the set for filming? Um, typically the first AD, the first assistant director, would notify us that we're going to um, use firearms uh, for a scene uh, whether they're loaded or not, they would say something um, about the fact that we're bringing something that's uh, uh, maybe not a rubber dummy, but an actual firearm onto set. And then typically um, the armorer would invite the first AD, the cast members involved, and any crew that would like to see both the firearm and the ammunition to see those safety checks, um, whether that's uh, looking through the barrel, um, shaking those rounds we discussed, the dummy rounds to hear that BB, or explaining to us that um, we are going to, the actor is going to fire X number of blanks and they're going to be of a certain power, and, and then making sure that um, anybody that's going to be in close proximity has the appropriate uh, safety equipment they need and they're prepared for that moment on camera. So what you just described regarding the armorer um, showing the gun and allowing people to look down the barrel, why would that be important to crew members? Um, because unfortunately there have been accidents in the past where the barrels weren't cleaned in firearms and a blank was fired and whatever debris was in that barrel injured or killed somebody on set. So with regard to your experiences with Ms. Gutierrez, uh, were the cast and crew ever invited to look down the barrel? Um, not to my recollection. And was that concerning to you? It was. Why? Um, well, they call them safety checks for a reason, and we were moving, uh, moving through those instead of pausing to, to have those checks. Um, with regard to the sequence that you described where the armorer uh, shows the dummy rounds to the cast and crew, um, and I want to be clear, in your experience, does the armor hand you the dummy round or the blank so that you can shake it? Uh, no, I'm not actually allowed to touch the firearms or ammo. So if, if um, a particular round was in question, we could ask um, uh, for them to you know, show us that it is uh, one type of round or another. And with regard to dummies, it, how would the armor do that? Um, again, the, the, in my experience, the way the dummy rounds are manufactured, um, you would have one of potentially three indicators um, that it is not a live round. Um, one being a hole drilled in potentially one side or, or two sides of the brass, so you'd actually see a hole in the bullet. Um, uh, sometimes the primer is either already um, struck by something or it's removed altogether, uh, prim the primer being the end of the bullet, um, or they would um, shake them like a, you'd hear like a rattle because there's a BB inside that brass or steel case. Who is the person responsible for shaking them for you or showing them to you? Uh, the armor. And on the set of Rust, did Ms. Gutierrez do any of that? Uh, not, not that I recall. In your experience on other movies, is the gun, when is the gun loaded with the ammunition by the armorer? And, and, and let, me, let, let me kind of make that more pointed. 
Is that something that's done away in secret, or is that something that's done in front of cast and crew? Uh, bless you. Uh, no, in my experience, um, it would be within moments of that uh, safety check where the cast and or crew are invited to see that firearm, they would then um, load that firearm knowing that we're about to roll the camera. Um, some armors, um, for reasons unknown to me, would in fact not even hand that firearm to the actor. They would actually place that firearm in the actor's holster and then indicate to the first assistant director that they're good to go and then the assistant director typically would call rolling at that point. So the gun is generally, in your previous experience, loaded with either the dummies or the blanks right there in front of cast and crew? Correct. Um, is that a practice that Ms. Gutierrez followed? Uh, not to my recollection. Do you recall ever watching her uh, or taking note of her loading the gun in the presence of cast or crew? I think there were a couple of times on set where we were doing these quick resets instead of cutting the camera where she was put in a position to reload that as quickly as she could and hand it back to our actors. And when you say she was put in a position, who would have put her in that position? Um, in that particular instance, both um, the first assistant director that's in charge of safety and um, the actor producer, Alec Baldwin. And with regard to your experience on other movies, have you ever seen an armor slow down that pace so that they are not being rushed? Yes. Did Ms. Gutierrez ever take any steps to slow those things down if she was being rushed? Not that I ever saw. Give me just one moment. <clears throat> Were you present for the filming of every scene that was filmed on the set of Rust during those two weeks? I believe I was present for every scene, maybe not every take. And when you say take, Explain to the jurors what you're talking about. Um, so uh, the scene may require a couple of... Uh, each time we roll the camera and cut, that would be considered one take. So depending on what uh, the director was, was wanting or if the actors maybe weren't happy with their performance, um, we would potentially do multiple takes as we worked our way through the different angles of a scene. So it may be from one actor to the next, you know, we shoot one uh, direction and do a couple of takes with one actor and then change directions and perhaps a couple of takes with the next actor that's um, in that same scene with them. So with regard to the individual takes that were recorded, were you present for every single take that was filmed? I was not. Approximately, if you can give us a percentage, uh, what percentage of those individual takes were you present for? Mm, uh, I think it would be safe to say I was there for 95% or more of them. Okay. In terms of the way that you've experienced this on, on other movie sets, um, how does the armorer behave with regard to... If the armorer provides a gun 
to an actor. In your experience on other movie sets, does the armor just walk away? In my experience, the armor is never out of uh, eyesight of whatever um, weapons or ammo they're in charge of. Was that the case on the set of Rust? It was not. Um, describe to us what you saw on the set of Rust with regard to that particular issue, that being the armor always staying within eyesight of the gun. Um, I, did, I don't know that the armor was always within eyesight um, of the firearms being used on set. Okay. And... Do you recall um, being present on the set of Rust on a day where there were what I'm going to refer to as accidental discharges of guns? Yes. Um, can you describe the first accidental discharge that you recall happening? Um, I think the first one was the, um, I don't know if the prop master was loading or unloading. And let me stop you. What's the prop master's name? Um, Sarah, I think her name was Sarah Zachary. That okay. That was her name. Um, she was, we were, we were outside of the character Rust's cabin, and I don't know if she was loading or unloading a handgun, but, um, unannounced to any of the crew that firearm discharged so we consider that a negligent discharge and how did you know it discharged I was within feet of it and she seemed pretty spooked when I turned around and it appeared as though she had um, shot that firearm at her foot can you tell us in your in your experience in your opinion, what you think that gun was loaded with? I, it, it made a bang, but it didn't, you know, I don't know if there was a bullet or not, because I don't know if it hit her foot, um, but it certainly made a loud noise that spooked us and the animals we had on set. I think we had a couple of horses on set, and, uh, and again, it was unannounced, so it was a surprise to everybody that was around. Were you preparing to film a, a scene or a take at that time? Um, yes. Um, was it announced by anyone whether the guns were going to be loaded with dummies or blanks? I don't think at that moment it had been, no. Okay. Um, the So when that accidental discharge happened, I mean, what did it sound like? Uh, a gun going off. Okay. And you indicated that this accidental discharge occurred because that gun was being loaded or unloaded by the prop master, Sarah Zachary. Is that right? That's correct. In your previous experiences on other movie sets with armorers, did you ever see the prop master loading and unloading the guns? I've never seen that, no. And can you describe what the other accidental discharge was that happened? Um, so like I had stated, we were um, kind of outside the cabin we were using as Harlan Rust's uh, cabin. And I'm going to stop you real quick. Uh, who's Harlan Rust? Um, Harlan Rust is the lead character um, in the movie, and that was played by uh, Mr. Alec Baldwin. Okay, please continue. Um, um, I believe it was um, Alec's uh, stunt double, so somebody dressed up to look like Alec, um, was going to be firing either some sort of long gun. I don't remember if it was a lever action gun or a shotgun, something out of uh, the window of the can, uh, cabin 
towards, um, I, I think it was the law enforcement that were chasing him, that were starting to catch up with him. There was supposed to be a gun, uh, some gunfire, and um, I believe that um, uh, uh, Hannah was prepping the stunt double in the cabin with that firearm and uh, again unannounced to any of us outside the cabin um, that firearm was discharged and what did it sound like uh, a loud um, gun going off and if you can estimate how much time passed between the first of these accidental discharges and the second uh, my recollection is it was they were within an hour of one another and in your experience on other movies with armorers uh, are accidental discharges common um, no have you ever experienced an accidental discharge on another movie I don't know that I have Okay. Right, we're, we're going to take our afternoon break. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. We'll start again at uh, 2.45. Thank you. All rise. Started 2.45 on time.
counsel. I can't do anything about the temperature, whether, I don't know if you're hot or cold, but probably hot, right? Cold. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, are we back on the record? Yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Audiego. Oh. Mr. Audiego, I think that when we broke, we, we, you had just finished describing uh, the accidental discharges to us. In your experience in the film industry and your opinion, who is responsible for accidental discharges on a movie set? Your Honor, I'm going to object. Again, his opinion is he's not an expert. He has no idea, and we don't know what set we're being talked about. He's not being tendered as an expert. Now I'm hearing things. I apologize. Uh, Mr. Adiego, do you recall the question that was asked that you, you've been permitted to answer? Um, if you don't mind asking again, please. In your experience and in your opinion, working in the film industry, who, what member of the crew is responsible for an accidental discharge? Um, I would say first and foremost, the armor. All right. Did the accidental discharges that you described cause you concern? Yes. Did you articulate that concern to anyone on set? I did. Who? Um, both the um, first AD and his uh, second in command on set, the second second AD. And when you say the first AD, who are you referring to? Um, Dave Halls. And what did you say to Mr. Halls? Uh, I don't recall my exact uh, words to Mr. Hall, but I expressed my um, frustration and anger with the fact that uh, safety seemed to be secondary to um, the production clock. And without saying what Mr. Halls said, um, was Mr. Halls responsive to your concerns? Mr. Halls ignored me and walked away. And what did you do then? 
I went to his um, uh, second, 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 um, uh, Anne, I don't recall Anne's last name, and expressed my anger and frustration and, and uh, asked that this put, be put on the production report. So, What's a production report? Um, the production report is uh, essentially the diary of everything that happens um, throughout production on the film set. Do you know whether or not this was ever included in the production report? I do not. Thank you. I'm going to take you to um, the morning of October 21st, 2021. Were you working on set that day? I was. And approximately what time do you think you arrived on set? Pretty early. I, I believe our call was between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. that day. And what does that mean, your call? Um, uh, my, so on that call sheet we've discussed, um, those emails would tell me specifically um, what time my department uh, requires my presence on the set for each day. So that would be my call time for the day. And when you arrived on set, did anything unusual happen? Um, yes. What was that? The uh, camera department had decided to uh, leave the show due to um, safety concerns and some other concerns they had. And if you can describe for the jurors what effect that had on the production and filming that day. Um, I would say it, it threw us into more of a state of chaos than we already were on that film that day. Okay, so let's back up. You said it threw you into more of a state of chaos. Um, generally speaking, what, what, was, what was the state of speed um, in terms of chaoticness or not on this movie set generally? I mean, at times we we would, uh, well, I guess we'd say we were moving at ludicrous speeds, um, that we've just trying to uh, race the production clock because we understood that we had a, a finite amount of time to complete a very ambitious schedule. So we seem to always be uh, rushed and under the gun to get stuff done and move on. Is there a saying in the film industry, uh, something about making your day? Yes. What does it mean in the film industry to make your day? Um, so if we know that on that call sheet we've been given that there are, for example, four scenes and production's budgeted 12 hours to, to complete that work in a day. Um, if we complete that, we've made our day. Otherwise, we've got to, we, production has to figure out where else um, to schedule that work to be completed. Why is making your day or not making your day problematic on a film set? Um, I, my understanding of Russ Productions is they were uh, uh, budgetarily restricted to the number of days. Whatever deals happen that I'm not aware of, that are privy, not privy to me, um, we had, uh, well, Helena and I discussed having uh, probably a few less days than we needed to actually complete uh, their ambitious schedule. Um, in an appropriate manner with two cameras. Okay, so you didn't have enough time. In a nutshell, we were we certainly didn't have enough time to yep. do what was being asked. 
So you indicated that the camera crew walking off created more of a chaotic environment. Can, can you give the jurors a little bit more of a description about how not having them there was affecting things? And were they replaced? Um, well, yes, they were replaced. Um, it, it, so on a, well, on most projects, but certainly on a small project where you're moving that fast, uh, we all count on each other and, and um, become close in that short amount of time. And um, so the camera department had counted on me and I had counted on them and, and knew that I could trust them. And, um, and Helena had handpicked us all to make up her crew. Um, so when suddenly, uh, you know, I think it was roughly six people of that crew decided to leave. Um, that was certainly a, a disruptive thing. And um, I think we soon learned that their replacements um, weren't, certainly weren't as qualified as they were. And also they only replaced one, uh, one of the camera teams. So it also meant to me that um, this schedule is gonna get much more intense because we now have half the equipment to do the same amount of work. Um. Um, I, I want to just get an idea from you in, in the days of filming leading up to the 21st. Um, is it typical for the director of photography to be um, operating an actual camera? Um, not typically, no. They hire two, well, an appropriate number of operators based on the cameras they have. Where does the director of photography usually spend his or her time during filming? Um, mostly on set with the crew and the cast. Um, occasionally they will um, uh, go to what we would refer to as like the video village, which is where the monitors are set up for the producers, or the writer, or maybe cast members that aren't involved in the scene to watch what's actually going on on set. So the six people that left, how many people came in to replace them? I, my recollection is two to three. Okay. Um, Did you have any discussions with Mr. Souza or Ms. Hutchins about making that day? Yes. And without saying what they said, what was your part of that conversation? Um, I think they were both concerned that that potentially would, uh, you know, uh, keep us from, prevent us from completing that day, maybe even completing the movie. So I just tried to reassure them that um, the operator that stayed and I would, you know, get them through the day, that we would, you know, continue on and um, try to continue making uh, the best film we could with the resources we were provided. So you indicated one operator stayed. Is that a camera operator? Uh, correct. And what was that person's name? Uh, Reed Russell. Thank you. So what what was the first scene uh, that that you all were filming on October twenty first? Just describe it to us generally. It doesn't have to be huge. Uh, yeah, um, I believe it was a couple of the lawmen. Uh, riding into this western town where we were filming with some kids and you know it's supposed to be an average morning in a western town whatever that is so uh, people uh, going about their day I think we had some animals on set and um, and I think it was the lawmen ride into town um, in pursuit of uh, Harlan Rust and when you say you had some animals on set, what kind of animals would you have on this movie set? Um, well, certainly the lawmen rode in on horseback, and I think we had some just kind of uh, farm-type livestock. Um, 
every day kind of changed a little bit. There may have been some chickens, some goats, some cows, uh, mules. There may have been other um, horses just tied up as you know, prop horses. Um, again, this was supposed to resemble a, a lively, working Western town. In terms of those animals, are there specific crew members that are put in charge of managing and caring for those animals? Yes. Um, is there a name for those people? Um, they're, they're typically called animal wranglers. Okay. And were there animal wranglers employed on this movie set? Um, my recollection is there was a number of them, yes. Okay. Uh, so w were you all able to complete the filming of that scene with the children and the animals? Um, as far as I recall, we, we had completed that scene. Do you recall, was there gunfire in that scene? I don't recall. Okay. I know... Um, I don't, and we don't want you to assume. But no, the lawmen that rode into town were certainly armed as lawmen, but I don't recall any gunfire in that scene. Okay, there wasn't a scene that required shootouts and blanks and stuff like Not that? Not to my recollection, no. Okay. And what then was the next scene that you all were going to be filming on that day? Um, I, believed, I believe we moved to the church upon completion of that scene. And what was your understanding of the scene that was to be filmed and, and perhaps was indeed filmed inside the church that morning? Um, that that part of the story we were we were filming that day was, um, I think at that point in the story, uh, Harlan Rust had been injured in in one of the previous shootouts story wise, and he finds this church or happens upon this church, so he's he knows he's being pursued by uh, the law, and I think it was story wise that he goes to essentially hide in the church and hope that in the hopes that he gets the draw on the lawmen when they enter the church. Kind of a, a last stand, if you will. And was that scene actually filmed prior to the lunch hour that day? Um, pieces of it. Pieces of it were. Okay. And have you had an opportunity uh, to see those uh, short clips? Um, I think I've, I saw one piece of that footage, yes, that was covered with the steady cam. Okay. Because this isn't the first time you've met me. It's not. Okay. Um, so I think that we have a stipulation to... Um, Let's start with States Exhibit 112, if you can help me, uh, Mr. Bow. Let me, we'll get set up. I would ask uh, for the court to admit State's Exhibit uh, 112 and permission to publish. No objection, Your Honor. All right, State's 112. Okay, we're good. Well, it's short. Let's see if it works. Okay. Um, if it doesn't, well, okay. I forgot about that. Um, I'm back to my Apple computer. These are short clips. Hopefully it won't freeze. Fingers crossed. Do you see what's on your screen there, Mr. Adiego? I do. And can you, um, what is this thing that, that we see before these movie takes? What's the information on that and what's it called? Um, that would be considered the uh, uh, sound slate. Uh, 
so it's a slate provided by the sound department that is used in editing and the script supervisor also uses it to keep track of uh, scenes and takes. And uh, does it tell you the scene and the take? What, what's the, what's the, the handwritten stuff at the top? It looks like it says 26 and 118B1. Do you know what that means? Um, mostly. So I can tell you that, of course, it has the title rust. It tells you, uh, it tells you on the left corner um, the director the director's name, Joel Souza, and on the bottom right, it has the director of photography's name, Helena Hutchins, and then it signifies, that A signifies that it's the A camera, uh, and I don't... Is, is, is there, is it A or is it B? Uh, it appears to be a red A. Okay, which okay, would be sorry. the A camera, and then it looks like on the top right corner, that would be take number one. And the other numbers typically would be uh, a scene number, so it potentially is scene 26, and then I think 118B would be the note the script supervisor uses for the editors and the writers, and that stuff I don't really get involved with. And who is the script supervisor for this film? Um, our script supervisor was uh, Mimi Mitchell, I believe was her last name. Okay, and what is, is that the time? What, what, what numbers are we seeing there in red? So it, it's time code, um, and depending on how the sound mixer and production wants to keep track of that, um, sometimes it's uh, elapsed time. So if we started at 6 a.m. and we're six hours into the day, it would show you, you know, that it's six, whatever, dot, zero, zero. Um, sometimes it's date and time, and I'm not, again, I, I don't often uh, deal with the details of the slate, so those numbers are generated by the sound department. Okay. And fed to the camera. And this scene is taking place where? Um, this is in the... It appears to be the church on um, Bonanza Creek Ranch. Okay, leap of faith. We're going to press play and hope we don't have any technical difficulties. Let me start that again. Uh, we don't have any sound. Give me just one moment. Hang on just a second. I'm gonna hang on. Uh, let Mr. Lewis try to sort out this technical issue and we're going to continue with your testimony and we'll come back to it uh, as soon as we're ready. Go ahead. He can put it on that. Okay. He's going to need it. Okay, I apologize for that. Um, the scene that was being filmed prior to the lunch hour that we're working up to showing. Um, describe what this scene was supposed to be. What was your understanding of what was going to be filmed? 
um, that uh, Harlan Rust um, was going to be laying a weight in this church for the lawmen that he knew were pursuing him and um, I think at this point in the story rapidly catching up to him. I'm sorry, with regard to um, firearms, uh, was it your, what was your understanding about what, if any, firearms were going to be present and used during the filming of that scene? Um, what I understood was that we were going to um, finish the piece we started looking at, where it's the uh, um, Harlan Rust's reaction uh, to the lawmen coming in, and then um, we were going to film one more piece uh, that we re would refer to as an ECU, an extreme close-up, where you see Harlan Rust. Uh, contemplating pulling his gun or not, kind of rubbing his hands, and then he starts to draw the firearm. Uh, my understanding is once we had that piece filmed, we were going to do what we would call a turnaround. So we'd then be filming from behind um, uh, Harlan Rust, Alec Baldwin, um, seeing the, the, I think it was two lawmen come into the church, and then the shootout would ensue from there. So, during the scene in the morning, was Mr. Baldwin armed with his prop gun? Uh, yes. And what was your understanding about whether that was a real gun or a replica? Meaning a rubber gun or a plastic gun? My understanding is Mr. Baldwin always wanted to use his, uh, what we refer to as his hero props. So I understood it to be a real uh, a cold gun at that point. And when you say cold gun, explain to the jurors what you mean. Um, cold gun would indicate that the um, armor and uh, potentially first AD had deemed that uh, weapon safe to be used on set. Uh, cold referring to the fact that um, the trigger could be pulled and nothing would happen. Did you know whether the gun in the morning was, um, whether it had dummies in it or whether it was just empty? I don't know. Okay. Um, so how did... Did, did you see for the morning session who brought Mr. Baldwin the gun? I did not. And how did that morning session inside the church go? Was it relatively uneventful? How was it? Uh, I mean, other than the previously stated uh, kind of state of rushed chaos we were in, I would say yes, mostly uneventful. And then when you had completed uh, those couple of takes that we're going to show here shortly, um, what happened then? Uh, we, I think that's when we broke for lunch for the day. And approximately how long was your uh, lunch? Um, I think we were doing half hour lunches. Maybe they might have been a little longer because our where lunch was was a little bit of a van ride from where we were filming. And when you say a little bit of a van, van ride, how far away was, how was that set up? Um, I think that, uh, so the production clock for us works on six tenths of an hour. So it may have been six minutes away. So if it was a half hour lunch, it may have ended up being approximately 42 minutes, um, you know, for that travel both ways to and from catering. And is the food just provided for you all right there on set? There's a caterer and a catering tent, yeah, if not on set, on the uh, facility where we were filming, yes. So approximately what time, if you know, would you have completed lunch and come back into the church to continue filming? Again, I, I think we started between 6 or 7, so lunch would have been called at 12 or 1 and 42 minutes after that. So for argument's sake, 2, two o'clock-ish. Okay. Um, and 
What was your understanding of anything that was going to take place immediately after lunch and perhaps before filming? Can you explain to the jurors? Um, uh, the I believe the decision was made. So we were, uh, for parts of that scene, we were using um, a steady cam, which is a uh, camera apparatus affixed to the camera operator. And I don't think they were getting quite what they wanted as far as um, uh, how the photography was portraying the story. So I brought the dolly in so we could mount the camera on the dolly and give them a more stable platform. Um, Uh, technical difficulties abound. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. Uh, please continue, sir. I, I think that was it for the... Okay. Um, so, while these gentlemen were speaking to me, did you explain that this was going to be a blocking? I did not. I let's, did not. let's go there. Um, explain what the blocking is. So, the decision was made to go from uh, Steadicam to the Dolly. So, once we... Uh, it takes a moment to convert that camera over uh, from one uh, use to another. So I'm getting the dolly close to the pew where Mr. Baldwin, Harlan Rust, would be sitting and um, uh, working with uh, uh, the camera operator, Reed. Helena had kind of mentioned where she wanted us, but I believe her and her gaffer were um, starting to prepare for the turnaround of when the law men came into the church. Um, so we were just trying to find, uh, blocking the shot, we would call it, trying to find the shot that best told the story in that moment that the, the director wanted to tell, which was to be, my understanding was to be an extreme close-up of Alec, um, pulling the, starting to draw his weapon. And then from what I know in the edit, his cut um, would have been, you see you as the audience, see that weapon start to leave his holster. And then we were going to then put the camera behind him to see the lawmen enter the church. And that's when this shootout would have begun in the church. So were cameras rolling? Uh, no, we were still blocking the shot. And were you present in the church when Ms. Gutierrez brought the firearm into the church? Yes. And tell the jury what you saw and or heard. I, I don't, I never saw uh, the interaction between Hannah and Dave in the church, but I could hear uh, Hannah telling Dave that the, um, that the firearm had been uh, checked before lunch and had been locked up during lunch. And then uh, Dave called out cold gun or cold weapon. I heard the word cold. And that's when I went back to focusing on my uh, task at hand, helping uh, Reed and Helena find that insert shot. I'm still trying to iron out this uh, issue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Adiego. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you recall who said cold gun? Did you describe that? Um, I did. Uh, it was I heard Dave Hall's call. I don't recall if it was cold gun or cold weapon, but I heard the word cold, which typically for me is what I need to hear. It, and it, and cold gun means it's not going to go bang. Correct. Okay. Um, with regard to Ms. Gutierrez's statement that you overheard uh, about her not having checked the gun since lunch, did that cause you any concern? It did. Why? Just accustomed to armors checking those guns again, 
on a regular basis and we had a break um, and typically that any firearm that's brought on set is checked even if it had been checked previously. Do you know how the gun got from Ms. Gutierrez to Mr. Baldwin? I do not. So after you heard Ms. Gutierrez's voice and you heard Mr. Hall's uh, call out cold gun, where was the gun the next time you saw it? In um, Mr. Baldwin, uh, yeah, in Mr. Baldwin's um, holster uh, on his left side. Um, did you see Ms. Gutierrez in the church? I don't recall seeing her in the church after lunch, no. So, go ahead and walk us through. Um, Mr. Baldwin now has the gun. Where is he, where is he sitting? What is he doing? Take us through this. Um, Mr. Baldwin seated in a church pew and, um, and uh, Reed and I are trying to find an angle looking kind of over his, um, his right elbow or right bicep to see his hands in his lap transition from his lap to uh, that firearm that's kind of hidden in a holster under the coat that he's wearing. Um, so if you can stand up, if you don't mind, and demonstrate what you believed Mr. Baldwin was supposed to do for the blocking. Um, my understanding was it was just to reveal uh, that part of you know the part of the gun that holds the bullets um, coming out of the holster, and then that portion of the you know that piece of photography was finished. Once we saw that gun coming out of the holster, it would again give the audience uh, the idea and that story that um, that Harlan Rust is about to uh, defend himself or try to shoot the lawmen before they shoot him as they enter the church. How close were the cameras to Mr. Baldwin? Um, the only camera we had in the church was um, I think at that point I was had the lens um, within a foot of Mr. Baldwin. And do you recall where Ms. Hutchins was? I do. You do? I do. Would you explain? Um, so directly if, if I'm sitting in the pew as uh, Harlan Rust, um, Helena Hutchins was essentially directly in front of um, uh, Rust uh, having a conversation with her gaffer. So there was maybe a couple of feet of air in between um, Mr. Baldwin and the pew that Helena and Serge were standing behind directly in front of Mr. Baldwin. And let me stop you. What's a gaffer? We don't know these terms. Oh, um, my apologies. Um, gaffer is the head of the lighting department. So he was discussing um, with the director of photography. My understanding, of course, is they were discussing what we were going to do when we turned around to see the lawman because we were already lit for the direction that we were filming. Do you remember the gaffer's name? Um, Serge is his first name, I believe his last name, and I, I don't want to slaughter it, but I think it was Svetne, Svetne, okay. I believe is his last name. Could you understand the conversation between Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Svetnoy? That's uh, my, that's my, thank you. my um, best try. Um, so often... I, we couldn't under none of us could understand um, because they often conversed in either um, Russian or Ukrainian, um, as they were both born and raised in that part of the world. So, do you know where Mr. Souza was at this point in time? Mr. Souza was uh, shoulder to shoulder, just to my right. He was looking at my uh, my dolly monitor so he could see what the camera was seeing. So. 
Why would the director be in the room looking at your monitor? Well, let me, let, let me ask it this way. Would the director normally be looking at that vantage point through from, from Video Village? Um, depends on the director and the situation. Sometimes they'll work with us more closely where they will be uh, shoulder to shoulder and we'll look at my monitor. We were still waiting for the, um, uh, the new camera assistants to finish converting from Steadicam to what we'd call studio mode. So I don't believe the camera actually had a monitor um, and potentially that's why he was looking over my shoulder instead of a bit removed in um, the video village. Okay, we're going to pause for a moment. Mm -hmm. We think we're going to be able to watch these videos and that's going to give everybody a much better idea of what was going on in there. Hope Springs Eternal. Okay, so we've uh, we've already gone through the slate and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm going to go ahead and play the video. This video will be uh, marked as States Exhibit 112. What's that noise we hear that ch -ch -ch -ch? I'm not actually sure. I was trying to figure that out myself. Oh. person um, speaking? Whose voice are we hearing? It sounds like Jensen Ankles. And, and is he an actor? He is an actor in Russ playing one of the lawmen, is my recollection. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Stand up slowly and toss in guns. Okay, we're going to do it again. And set and action. On the roof, did you get up nice and slow, toss any weapons you might have? There ain't no iteration of you walking out of this church unless you stand up slowly and toss them guns. Okay, and set. Answer That's the answer to your question earlier, that sound. Why don't you explain to us what we're seeing? So what you just saw for a brief moment was one of the effects uh, department people coming in to um, uh, spray at what we'd call atmosphere. So dust or whatever there, I don't know what's in their uh, spray cam, but that is what that sound was. And that's what they were doing was adding atmosphere that makes it look a little foggy. And, and if hard light comes through those windows, you would kind of see those lights, uh, the rays of light in that fog. And I just uh, backed this video up to one minute, six seconds, so that I can ask you the position that Mr. Baldwin is sitting in in this video. Um, is that the same or similar position that he was in in the blocking scene after lunch? Uh, yes, similar. Okay. I'm down here like this, yeah. and when he says Harlan Rust, I'm gonna go. Boop. Okay. And you gotta come down here for that. Yeah. Anyway, we'll see if we can do that. Ready? Here we go. Right. You want on, to on another take? I think. Here we go. Ready? All right, another take. Where are we? <clears throat> and set. Ready? And action. Harlan Rust. Did 
you get up nice and slow, toss any guns you have. Now, you know what duration you walking out of this church unless you stand up slowly and toss some weapons. Russ. All right, let's go with the sensor. Can we try this? Uh, so let me ask you, it, just so that we get an idea, where we see Mr. Baldwin sitting in the church pew, um, where is the door to the church? Behind the camera. From Mr. Baldwin's perspective, is it in front of him? In front of Mr. Baldwin, yes. And where is Mr. Ackles, uh, the gentleman who is speaking in the scene? Um... It sounds as though he's just to the left of the camera. So where would that be in relation to the door? Um, Jensen would be in between uh, Mr. Baldwin and the door. Okay, and, and if you can estimate how many feet, how big is this room and how many feet are there from where Mr. Baldwin is sitting to the door? In that instance because we had moved the pews around a little so in that instance mr baldwin's less than 20 feet from the door would be my guesstimation okay and who's this gentleman here that we can see in the in the video uh that is uh, dave halls okay i'm going to go ahead and finish it just for mm -hmm. completeness and then we'll move on to our next one all right I am now going to play what will be marked as State's Exhibit 112A. Um, I would ask the court to uh, go ahead and admit 112A and give permission to publish. No objection, Your Honor. All right, 112A is admitted. You may publish. So whip it out. Yeah. Okay, well, let me get this all greased and ready. Okay, ready? Okay, ready? Ready. And set. Ready and action. Island rough. Okay, uh, so the 
the blocking, you can take these, thank you, Shad. Um, the blocking that you were describing um, as a person who was working in the room, were you expecting Mr. Baldwin to pull the gun all the way out? Like, like what we just saw in those clips? Um, in the blocking of uh, the ECU. What's the ECU? Uh, extreme close up. Okay. I was not. Okay. My uh, under. Go ahead. My understanding was it was just to kind of reveal that weapon coming out of the holster to the camera. So I think that we may have uh, ended uh, your description of what was going on in the after lunch session uh, where Mr. Souza was standing. Um, and were there other people in the church also? Yes. Do you know approximately how many people were in there? Um, myself, Reed, the camera operator, uh, Zach, uh, the boom guy was... When you say the boom guy, what is uh, the Sorry, sorry, guys. Uh, sound, sound, the sound, um, uh, the person handing, uh, holding the um, sound boom. So recording sound for the sound mixer was in the church. Um, Joel was uh, shoulder to shoulder, like I had described, looking at my monitor. I uh, believe uh, Mamie Mitchell was to his right. Um, uh, wardrobe, a uh, woman named Doran was in there, I think, looking over Mimi's shoulder at the monitor. Um, Helena, Serge, um, my direct boss, uh, Reese Price, who's the key grip, he's the head of the grip department, um, had just come in uh, to work with Helena and Serge. Um, Dave Halls, um, and maybe uh, one of the effects guys I recall uh, was kind of in and out, keeping an eye on things because they had they had pre-rigged some of their effects stuff in the ceiling uh, again in preparation for the big turnaround that we were about to do. Okay. So I don't I didn't give you a number, but. I think that works out to 12-ish. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so keep walking us through it. What happens next? Um, so we, uh, I guess Reed and I are, are trying to find the camera angle that uh, Joel, the director, is is happy with that he feels will tell that piece of the story. Um, I think, like I said earlier, mentioned earlier, I believe um, Helena and Serge were discussing how to change the lighting for the turnaround. Um, uh, Reese, uh, my boss, Reese Price was in there. I think he had just brought in a bounce card, maybe for that insert, maybe for the next shot. We don't know what a bounce card is. Uh, um, a lighting apparatus, so he was going to use some of the light um, coming through one of the windows and potentially um, reflect that back towards uh, Mr. Baldwin to help illuminate him. Um, and um, I think Joel and uh, Joel, the director, and Alec uh, had some uh, brief conversation back and forth about what the goal was for that shot. And um, and I think Alec had drawn it once to kind of audition what he thought his action should be um, for uh, Joel, and um, and then he drew it again, and um, it went off, and uh, you know, instantly, I mean, a, a firearm went off in a small wooden church, so the concussion, ears ringing, that moment of panic in everybody. Um, I think the first person I made eye contact with was was Elena, who was clearly injured by whatever that gunshot was, that noise we had just heard. And in fact, she was starting to go flush and uh, I think holding her, her right side um, and uh, and then I, I think that Joel 
uh, let out some sort of uh, uh, scream or or made some noise that you know to indicate he was also injured and um, I think I just uh, went to my attention went to Joel because he was the closest to me um, I think Reed I recall Reed and Serge moving uh, Pew out of the way to help Helena get to the, basically to lay Helena down and, and start um, tending to her figure out what her injuries were or injury um, and I started uh, attending to um, uh, Joel. I think I yelled out that if you can't help us, get the fuck out of here. And someone called 911. And I do recall uh, Mimi's voice in the distance talking to 911 and, and telling him where we're at. And um, I tried to calm Joel down. We had a good rapport, so I just tried to calm him down and, and let him know that we were going to get through it because I didn't know what else to do in that moment. Um, and then soon after, uh, the medic and the best boy, Electric, uh, came into the church. Um, and, and I'm going to stop you real quick. Mm -hmm. The medic, do you recall her name? Um, her, I, her first name was Cher. I don't recall her last name. Okay, and who was the other person you said best boy? The best boy electric, uh, Matt uh, Hemmer, I believe was his last name. He was uh, Serge's uh, second in command is what a best boy is. So um, the gaffer and the key grip each have a best boy and then the rest of their department. Um, and uh, my understanding was Matt had some combat medical training. Um, so he came in to assist the uh, medic share. And um, I think I, I... um When... Right after the gun went off, do you recall seeing Ms. Gutierrez in the church? I do not. Um, and did Mr. Baldwin stay in the church? I, he sat down in that same pew, I think in that moment when I yelled out that if you can't help us, you need to you know, get out of here. I think he sat down and then at some point, I know I, I looked over and he was gone. So. Okay. And in terms of your attention to Mr. Souza, um, what were you doing to him? Were you touching his body? What were you doing? I was. I was. So um, Joel was wearing a, kind of a, a thick hoodie, and I believe he had a T-shirt or a couple shirts on underneath, so it was start to uh, figure out where uh, Joel had been injured. He was certainly at that point um, writhing in pain and and uh, concerned for himself asking me how Helena was and and I think coming to the realization that he had been shot um, so I was trying to find uh, where he was wounded um, so started pulling back his hoodie to uh, reveal what appeared to be a circular wound in his right shoulder. And at that point, um, I think the the sheriff and uh, Matt came in. Uh, they had gloved hands, I didn't, so I had some of his blood on my hands. And um, I think I helped them uh, roll a Joel over. Um, one of them had uh, trauma shears to cut his shirt off and then I helped roll him over and I was in a position um, to see that uh, what appeared to be um, a bullet just under the skin um, basically where his right shoulder blade was um, and he was in a great deal of pain and um, I think that Cher gave me some gauze to just put some uh, pressure on the wound while they attended to um, Helena's injuries, which uh, I gathered at that time were certainly much more severe. 
because of her uh, proximity to the firearm. And could you hear Ms. Hutchins? I, I know you indicated that Mr. Souza was um, kind of yelling out in pain. Uh, did you hear anything from Ms. Hutchins? If I did, it was just, uh, you know, the groaning and discomfort from being uh, shot by a firearm. I don't remember anything verbal from uh, Helena. Okay. And at some point, did paramedics arrive? Uh, yes. And if you know, at some point, was Ms. Hutchins uh, taken for medical care offset? Um, yes. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, um, I stayed with Joel uh, until they carried him out. And what I uh, observed was they were trying to um, uh, stabilize her. I heard them call for a, a life flight. So they were trying to stable, <laughs> stabilize her to get her in a helicopter and get her to whatever ER they felt was uh, appropriate. And at some point in time, were you notified that Ms. Hutchins had passed? <laughs> yes. Mr. Adiego, when, when you heard the gunshot and you saw these people fall, did it occur to you in that moment that it was a live round, that there was a real, a, a real bullet in that gun? Um, I don't, maybe not in that moment. I, I think it became clear when uh, like I mentioned, I, I rolled Joel over, helped roll Joel over to see what very much looked like a large caliber bullet just being barely held in by his skin. Okay. And is this the first time in your life that you've ever seen a bullet? Uh, no. Okay. So you knew a bullet when you saw one? I, yes. Okay. Um, Did you ever see Ms. Gutierrez after the gunshot went off? Not until today. Okay. And I want to back up. Um, the, the people who, the camera crew that walked off that morning, did you know those people? Um, as well as you can know anyone in two weeks, sure. Based on your time on set and everything that you knew about what was going on on that movie set, do you have any reason to believe that any of those people planted live ammunition on set? Judge, I'm gonna object to speculation, lack of foundation, and whatever. Well, I think he can answer the question whether he has any reason to believe that they did or not. Council approach.
Sir, do you recall the question? I don't. Do you have any reason to believe that live ammunition was planted by disgruntled crew members who left that morning? I, I do not. And based on everything that you heard when you were in the church after lunch, do you have any understanding of who the person was that loaded that gun? Um, yes. Who is the person that you believe loaded the gun? The armor. And who's that person? Um, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. And do you see her sitting in court today? I, I have seen her. She's behind you, yes. Okay. And just for the record, can, can you point out what, what Ms. Uh, Gutierrez is wearing? A uh, gray blazer with a black collar, hair in a ponytail. Uh, will the record reflect uh, that the defendant has been identified? Yes. <laughs> At any point in time when you were in the church after lunch, did you hear anyone tell Ms. Gutierrez to leave the church? No. I'll pass the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, uh, when you started your testimony, early on in your testimony, you talked about being on 12 prior movies with armor or something like that. Recall that? Yes. And you talked about you're used to seeing ex-cops, ex-military, Remember that? Yes. As the armor, the primary, were those all males? I can't give you a definitive on that. I think there may have been a female or two, female armor that I worked with in the past. But you just didn't, um, you weren't used to seeing a young 24 year old armor, were you? A uh, female. I wasn't used to seeing a young 24 year old armor. And a female. Mm, that doesn't play into it for me, so it, whether male or female doesn't really matter in that case. Okay, and I want to get into another, and we'll work through these topics, but you've talked a lot about things that you think Ms. Gutierrez-Reed did. One of the things you didn't tell the jury is that you've sued Russ Production and Alec Baldwin, haven't you? I have. You what? Yes. You, you have a pending lawsuit right now, don't you? Uh, as far as I know, it's pending, yes, sir. And your attorney's in the courtroom? He is indeed. Been watching your testimony? Clearly. See how you do? You'd have to ask him, sir. Okay. And you've sued Alec Baldwin and Russ Production, but you have not sued Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, have you? Again, you'd have to talk to my counsel about who I've actually sued. Have you read the lawsuit? I perused it. You perused it? What does that mean? Did you read it, all the paragraphs, or did you just read page one and just said, knock yourself out, lawyer, go ahead? Um, I think I got past page one, but since I'm not in your industry, I don't understand what a lot of that is, and I trust my counsel to represent me. It seems like you're making a lot of opinions earlier on what armors do. You filed a lawsuit. Um, it seems like you, you could have read your lawsuit, right? Objection Did, relevance to whether or not he read his lawsuit? Well, I want to ask if he's he's read these paragraphs because he has a totally different story in his lawsuit that he did today. So I want to ask him if he's read and adopted this, this lawsuit. And I think he's already answered that. Did you approve your lawsuit being filed? I must have. Because it was filed. Right? Sorry. Okay. And, and in that lawsuit, you're suing for a variety of things, punitive damages, right? 
Again, I'm not a lawyer, sir, so you'd have to discuss that with my counsel. Well, you know you're suing for loss of enjoyment of life. Certainly. Okay. And you know you're suing for medical expenses and non-medical expenses, right? I understood that to be the case, yes. So out of this tragedy, you claim that you have a blast injury, right? I believe that's in the documents you're referring to, yes, sir. Did you go to the doctor for a blast injury? Um, I have talked to my physician about what happened that day, yes. You've talked to your physician? What, did they do any tests? Did they take any x-rays? Did you just tell him I was in this? And I, what? I described the incident and he did what he felt was appropriate. What was that? I'm not going to discuss my medical treatment with you, sir. Okay. Well, so you're in any event, you're suing uh, breast production and Alec Baldwin, right? Yes. And, and you're here telling this jury all about Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, but in your lawsuit, you talk about defendants, rest production, Alec Baldwin, cut corners and cut costs, and it endangered the cast and crew. So you believe that, right? Rest production? I do. And you believe that, that their hiring of Gabrielle Pickle and Ro Walters to manage the budget was not a good idea because they uh, have cost-cutting problems on prior sets? You believe that? Correct. Okay. And you also believe that David Halls had prior safety issues, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, on a prior set, he didn't manage that safely, did he? That was my understanding. Okay. And you also believe, you, you knew that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed had asked for more training days as an armorer. You knew that. I, I don't... In the form of question, there needs to be a question. It sounds like a statement. Were, you were Over, overruled. Okay, you're aware that Miss Gutierrez Reed asked Gabrielle Pickle for more time as an armor, more training days, and more armor days. You're aware of that. I became aware of that after two people were shot. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, we, you were. It's in your lawsuit. It's part of your lawsuit. Uh, okay. Okay. So, let me ask you this: Are you hoping that? You can come in and testify here today, and something happens to Ms. Gutierrez Reed, and you can it'll help your lawsuit. I'm hoping for justice, sir. For Two yourself. people were injured on a film set. That has not only affected me; that has affected the film industry. And you want money for that? I want justice. You in want what? money? Your your lawsuit didn't say justice; it says money. Again, says you'd have to for money. Is that isn't that correct? Mr. Foles needs to let the witness answer the question. That he's being argumentative. This needs to be a cross. You want to be argumentative? I, I'll let him answer. Okay. I, I agree. You're suing for money. I asked my lawyer to help bring justice in this case, and if that doesn't mean criminal, then I would assume that means some sort of monetary justice. Yes. Okay. Now. You also understood that Mr. Halls did not post the safety bulletins on, a, on, a, on to any of the call sheets, correct? I understood that production did not furnish us with safety bulletins, sir. Okay, so production. So that may not have been Mr. Halls. It may have been somebody else in production. Again, production okay. is all-encompassing of, of Mr. Halls and the other ADs that would generate that information. And you also indicate that Mr. Halls was the overall safety coordinator on set, correct? Um, that's typically the, one of the jobs, one of the many jobs of the first assistant director, yes, sir. And so it's his responsibility to convene the safety meetings you testify to, right? Typically it is, yes. And in this particular set, he did not do that on every day of the filming, did he? Uh, not to my recollection. And in fact, the day that this, uh, you described it as the camera crew walked off the day of the shooting incident, you, you described it as more chaotic uh, than it had been, and that day there was no safety meeting convened by Mr. Halls, was there? Um, not that I was invited to. Okay. You're also, you've indicated that Mr. Baldwin didn't follow gun safety rules. You believe that, right? I do. And you believe that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed 
was operating in two jobs in props and armor, and you thought that was dangerous, that production did that, didn't you? I did. And and you you um, felt it was dangerous and part of your lawsuit that they should not have put her in those two positions. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And in fact, sir, you've never been on all of your 12 prior movies with armors. You've never been on a set where an armor was part-time, right? I don't recall ever working on a set that had a part-time armor. No, sir. Okay. So this would be your first one on the rest set where they had part-time? Potentially. Okay. And in fact, because it's in your suit, you, don't, you, you thought that was a terrible idea, right? If it says so in the suit, then I must have said that, yes. Okay. And this was a gun-heavy set with guns operating on 17 of the 21 scheduled film days, yet you knew that they weren't paying Ms. Gutierrez-Reed for more than eight armor days, right? I had no idea what they were paying Ms. Gutierrez. Were you aware that whether her armor days had run out by the time of the shooting incident? I was not privy to that information, sir. Okay. And you're probably not also privy to the fact that she was regularly performing props duties as part of her uh, daily duties on the set. Were you aware of that? Did you see her doing those prop duties? I believe that it was noted on the call sheet that she had more than one responsibility. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see her, for example, rolling cowboy cigarettes, having her do jobs like that in her props duties? Can't say that I did. So you didn't see her all the time then? Um, no, because my job takes a lot of focus and I have essentially five bosses at any given moment, so I have to focus on my tasks at hand. Well, that's, that's what you said also, that, that you didn't see who was in the church or you didn't see what was happening because you have to focus on your job. You have to focus on your camera and what you're doing with that, right? So you're not always seeing everything else around you. I'm not necessarily seeing, but I'm trying to watch and listen to everything uh, that I can on set. Let me ask you about that, listening to everything. You talked about uh, what the negligent discharge by Sarah Zachary, nothing being called out in terms of uh, a gun being operated. Do you recall that testimony? I do. Now, what channel, radio channel, were you using on set? Would you regularly use? I'm a grip, so I'm always on channel eight, sir. Channel eight. And do you, do you understand, or did you understand that the armor operates on channel one, and that's when that's called out on channel one and it goes to David Halls? Did you know that? Um, if it only goes to channel one and Dave Halls, then somebody's failed at their job because their job is to let everybody know what's going on with firearms and ammunition on set. And were you aware then, sir, before you gave your testimony to the jury that that responsibility is Mr. Halls then to call out, we're going to have a gun scene? Were you aware of that? I'm aware of what Mr. Halls' responsibilities are, certainly. Okay, well then, why didn't you say that earlier? That when this was called out, you may have been on the wrong channel. Maybe Mr. Halls didn't call it out. Did you not know that? I don't understand your question. I wasn't I, on the wrong channel. I'm on channel 8, where I'm supposed to be, sir. Okay, well then, the failure was not Ms. Gutierrez-Reeds, which you wanted to imply to the jury. It was Mr. Halls, wasn't it? Um, Ms. Gutierrez Reed loaded a firearm that killed my friend and injured a director. I'm not talking about the incident. I'm talking about the negligent discharge with Sarah Zachary. We're talking about that incident. Now, first of all, you have no idea who loaded that weapon that Ms. Zachary negligently discharged, do you? I, I wasn't there when the weapon was loaded, so no. Okay. And you have no idea. But you said earlier you don't even know if there was a bullet in it. Um, I saw a bullet in Joel Souza's shoulder. I, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I know you want to keep coming back to it for your lawsuit, but I'm talking about Sarah Zachary's negligent Honor, discharge. I have to object uh, to, to, to Mr. Bowles's tone, uh, indicating Just that this. The, please, no commentary. Yes, I won't, Your Honor. I won't. Thank you. So, with regard to Sarah Zachary's negligent discharge, you have no idea whether it was a blank, whether it was a live round, you just don't know. Correct. Okay. Now, you talk a lot throughout your testimony about all these failures you find in Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, yet in your lawsuit, it's all about production of Mr. Baldwin. Can you explain that? Why you talk about production of Mr. Baldwin in your lawsuit? 
And not Ms. Gutierrez Reed? I would refer you to my counsel, sir. I don't she... write, I didn't write that lawsuit, so okay. I would refer you to my counsel for those questions. You went after the people with money for the lawsuit, right? And then... I went after production, the people responsible for hiring the people that killed and shot someone on a film set. And, and you, as part of that, um, talk about that the decision to hire Ms. Gutierrez Reed was motivated by production desire to have a quick and cheap production. That was part of their desire to hire a cheaper uh, position in that role, make her do two jobs, right? Apparently that's what it says, that's what it says. Okay. And you indicated that this was constantly rushed and reckless and chaotic on set, correct? Correct. And you heard Mr. Baldwin a couple of times at least rushing people and telling them to move, 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 right? I did. Okay. Did you hear Mr. Halls do that also? I did. Did you ever stand up to Mr. Baldwin and say, no, we're not going to move this fast? That's not my job, sir. Okay. And did you ever see anybody else stand up to Mr. Baldwin and tell him not to move that fast? I don't recall anybody standing up to Mr. Baldwin on the set of Russ, sir. Wasn't going to happen, was it? Uh, Objection to the form of question calls for speculation. You, you never saw anybody. Can restate the question? Yes, Your Honor. You, you were aware, based on your uh, seeing Mr. Baldwin, how he interacted with everybody, it was your perception nobody was going to stand up to him, wasn't it? Correct. Yeah, because he's... he's um, well, he, he's running the show. He's the big boss, right? He's both, well, he's the producer, one of the writers, and on the call sheet, he's number one. So, yes. So, wouldn't you, wouldn't you find it difficult for a 24-year-old female armor in her, as you call it, her second movie, with everybody else, grown men, not standing up to Mr. Bowen, wouldn't you find that difficult for her also? I wasn't in her position. Now, you also talk about the IATSE armor. You knew that um, Ms. Gutierrez Reed was not yet in the Union. Actually, I, my understanding was it was a Union show and the crew was Union. But you didn't know whether she was not union. She's not union. You didn't know that. Mr. Bowles is testifying, Your Honor. No. I'm asking if he's aware. No, no, no. But you are not. testifying. You said she's not in the union. Okay, that's your testimony. Well, I'm so asking ask you. the ask it as a question rather than testifying. Yes. Were you aware that Miss Gutierrez Reed is not union? I was under the impression that we were doing a union movie. Everybody on the crew was union. I didn't learn that she was not yet in the union until after. So you did learn that after? Correct. Okay. And you know from your experience in over 100 credits and being on a movie, having the union behind you makes it, uh, makes it likely that you can stand up. I mean, in other words, if there's a safety issue and you, you have your union behind you, you can raise that because you've got the union. Um, on a union movie, any crew member has the support of a union, whether they're union or not. They are represented by IATSE. Well, could you have stopped uh, the whole production if you wanted to, if you saw all these safety issues? I certainly could have voiced my opinion whether or not they would have honored that and stopped anything. I cannot say. Okay, so you, you did say on the safe, the negligent discharges, you went to Mr. Halls and you told him you were concerned and you told him you're concerned about safety. Is that correct? That is correct. And you also told his second AD, and you told both of them, right? Anne was his second second, just to be clear. But yes, second, I did second, mention second. it to Anne as well, that, it, that I was concerned and that this needed to be on the dailies the daily production report, um, knowing that the other producers typically read the production reports, as would the insurance company or whoever's bonding the film. Okay, and, and you didn't see any anybody do anything after you made those complaints? 
Um, I wouldn't necessarily see anybody do anything because they would potentially be on channel one having that conversation amongst themselves. Well, did you see anything happen like additional training, uh, um, any kind of actions taken by Mr. Halls that you saw? I didn't see anything change. Okay. So the day of the incident, the day of the shooting, you indicated to Ms. Morrissey on direct that you didn't see Ms. Gutierrez read in the church, but you didn't have concerns or words to that effect that after the the firearm had come into the church, um, you didn't have concerns because I think you testified the armor would check that. Is that what you said? I believe that misstates the testimony. Well, tell me what you said. I, I may have misheard it. Tell me what you said. I don't know what you're getting at. I don't know what you want me to well, restate, sir. Let me ask you, um, did you, you didn't see Ms. Gutierrez read in the church. I only heard her in the church. Did you look around and after you heard her to see if you could see her in the church? No. Okay. So did you see if anybody else, um, Sarah Zachary from props was in the church? I think we've already uh, covered this, and no, I don't oh, okay. recall anybody from the props department seeing anybody from the props department in the church. Okay. Now, Sarah Zachary, I want to talk about her for a minute. You knew, or were you aware that she would load firearms too at times? I became aware when she had a negligent discharge on set. Okay. Did you also ever see her loading firearms on set? I don't recall beyond that incident uh, her really dealing with firearms, if at all. You know that that Sarah Zachary was Hannah Gutierrez Reed's boss. I do as props master. Mm -hmm. okay. And now you, earlier you talked about your understanding of armor, but isn't it true that props department is in charge of the ammunition? Those are props. That's my understanding of how the props department works. Sure. Okay, so when you said earlier that the guns and ammo would be the armor, in reality, the ammunition falls under the props department. It's a prop. Um, my understanding is live ammunition is absolutely the armorer's responsibility. Any other ammunition that may be used in belts or bandoliers or strewn about on set is, uh, falls under props. Well, live ammunition is never supposed to be on the set. Um, when I say live ammunition, I'm referring to blanks. Okay. Something that can go bang and, and hurt someone. Okay, so, so let's be clear. You're not, a blank is not a, a, a round with a projectile. It's not a, a, a real bullet. It's a blank that, that shoots powder, right? It shoot, my, no, my, go ahead. Go ahead, I'm sorry. My understanding of blanks are, uh, it looks very much like a real bullet. Um, they're crimped differently at the end, so they don't actually contain a bullet. Uh, but beyond that, I don't know that I would, you know, I don't know if they're marked in any other way other than seeing the ends crimped. Okay. And you've never been in armor yourself. I've never been in the props department at all. No. Or the props department. So. When you make opinions about what you think, uh, you really have no idea because you've never served in that role. It's just what you, you've seen over other movies? Um, it's what I've learned in almost 30 years uh, in the film industry, yes. Okay. Now, when you, you talked about guns <clears throat> being left out on the cart, I want to ask your experience in prior movies. Have you seen carts that are professional-looking that can be locked up? that an armor can use to lock up those weapons on it? Yes, and I believe I described that earlier. Okay, and this card in this set was not like that. I believe it was just kind of a, a more of what I would be accustomed to seeing craft services use, like an open uh, gray plastic cart. And were you aware that it took uh, over a week for the props department even to get that card? I'm not in the props department. I'm not really aware of what they do Okay, in that sense. So this cart that they had on set that they were supposed to use for their firearms it's, it, on this rust set, it wouldn't lock, 
It was more like something you would see in the crafts department. So it's got so and production provides that, right? Again, I don't know what the props department were brought or what they were provided. A lot of us rent the production companies our appropriate gear. Some of that may be carts, some of that may be tools. Okay, so you don't you don't know. You, no. you also don't know if the firearms that you said were laying out from time to time on the cart were real firearms or were plastic, were replica. You don't know that for sure. Um, I can tell you that the firearms certainly looked real as they would reflect the sunlight. They were certainly metal firearms, whether they were uh, actual fire firing gun. Um, there may have been a long gun or two that had some sort of sock or some soft covering on them, sure. And the handguns had the socks too. You never saw those? I don't recall seeing the handguns in any kind of container, sir. Okay. Um, Did you ever hear Hannah call out the load amounts? Uh, you testified earlier you didn't, but you weren't always around those scenes when Hannah was dealing with the, Hannah Gutierrez Reed was dealing with the firearms, were you? Um, I was on set 95% or more of the time, so there may have been an instance where she called out whatever power that plank load would have been, and I missed it. And again, if she's calling it out on channel one, and Mr. Halls is supposed to then communicate that, and you're on another channel, she may have called it out and you didn't hear it. Well, the protocols on set typically is the armorer would, would call that out verbally. Whether, what she does on her radio, I don't know. I'm not on that channel. And then the first assistant director would parrot that and let us all know and to you, make sure there was redundancy and that we heard it was hot or cold. And sir, are you, are you sitting now under oath telling this jury that Hannah never called out the loads that were used on that set? Are you going to tell them that under oath, that you never heard that? Objection, Your Honor. That has not been his testimony, and he's already answered this question. It's been asked and answered. So other than reporting to Mr. Halls and... and the second, did you ever report this to anybody else if you were so concerned about it? Did you report it to Gabrielle Pickle? Did you report it to anybody else? Did you report it to Joel Souza? Um, I believe that Joel Souza and Helena, before she was killed, had a conversation about some of the safety issues, that was my payroll question. issues, and I did notify Local 80, which was the union that represented me while I was making that movie. When did you notify Local 80? You'd have to contact Local 80. It was early in the movie, and I can't give you a definitive date, sir. Well, no, I'm asking you. I'm not going to contact Local 80. They're not here in court. He's, he's already yeah. indicated he doesn't remember. Judge, I can, can I do my cross-examination? Well, sure. If you do it properly, you can. Uh, I'm doing it properly. Listen, listen, listen. Yeah. Ask the question yeah. about the date. He said he didn't remember, and then you started to tell him you weren't going to ask that person and that he was going to tell you in so many words, okay? Yes. So let's not be argumentative. Let's yes. just ask him. You can ask him one more time. So do you have any idea what date you may have contacted Local 80? I believe it was in the first week of production. Okay. So the first week of production was before any, any um, accidental discharges would have happened. That doesn't mean I wasn't concerned about safety. And I understand, and my, my question was not that. I understand you were concerned. My question was, that was before any of the accidental discharges. Um, I don't recall exactly if that was before or after, but once I contact Local 80, that doesn't mean I stopped talking to Local 80 throughout production. So I think we had more than one uh, conversation about it. Because you're contacting Local 80, did they do anything about it? Um, my understanding was they contacted the New Mexico local, which is 480, and a representative from 480 showed up, and a, possibly a representative from the camera union, Local 600, also showed up. What happened at that point? Did, did they do anything? Um, they have conversations that I'm not part of, right. sir. Yeah. 
Ultimately, the camera crew was disgruntled, and they walked off the day before the shooting. Part of that was their hotel situation. You were aware of that, weren't you? Uh, I don't know about disgruntled, but I know that they were promised hotels or housing, and, and those promises never came to fruition. Okay. And so they left, and, and the next day when they, uh, you, there had to be a new camera crew, um, they had to get some more people. You, you were aware Video Village was down? I was not. You didn't know Video Village was down at all? Asked and answered, Your Honor. You, uh, sir, you said earlier Baldwin always wanted to use his hero props, or words to that effect. Do you recall that? Yes. And by that you meant he wanted to use the real, for example, the real revolver? That was my understanding of his, his uh, the way he liked to perform, yes, sir. Okay. And, and would that also include, sir, the, like the knife, those kind of, is that what you're meaning by hero props? Um, my recollection is Mr. Baldwin always wanted to be uh, ready to call rolling when he was ready. So hero props uh, in his wardrobe, mm -hmm. essentially ready to go. Okay. And everybody else had to be ready to go when, when he was ready? Yes. Okay. So that, sir, it was your understanding, and I, uh, you may have said this, and I just want to go back over it, but that Mr. Baldwin did not, that scene or that rehearsal did not require the, the draw. Was that your understanding? Um, my understanding was it was really just the initiation of that movement mm -hmm. was the part of the story that Joel Sousa wanted to tell. Okay. And that, I think you called it an extreme close-up shot of his hand. 
Correct. Coming out? Okay. So it would be coming out of his holster, and there would be an extreme close-up on that. Uh, correct. The frame would have been essentially his right hand going into his coat to draw his firearm. Okay, sir. Your Honor, may I have just a moment? Yeah. Your Honor, that's all the questions we have. We direct. Mr. Odiego, if you are aware, are you the only person suing Mr. Baldwin and Russ Productions? Um. Not from my understanding. There are others, correct? Uh, correct. And Mr. Bowles asked you in your lawsuit, you claimed that you have lost enjoyment of your life as a result of the incident. Is that correct? Yes, it is absolutely correct. Just to be clear, did you receive a subpoena for your testimony today? Uh, I believe that my counsel received a subpoena from both sides for today, yes. Do you know, sir, did anyone force Ms. Gutierrez to accept a job as an armor and props assistant? Uh, force her? Not that I'm aware of, no. Do you know if anyone forced Ms. Gutierrez to continue working on the set of Rust? Uh, not when to, things were chaotic and difficult. Not to my knowledge, no. Is Mr. Baldwin on trial today? Uh, it appears that he is a bit, yes. It, I'm asking you, is this the trial of Mr. Baldwin? No, it's not. Is this the trial of Rust Productions? Uh, no, it's not. Is Mr. Hall's on trial today? He is not. On October 21st, 2021, did Ms. Gutierrez show the dummy rounds to the cast and crew, as you have indicated, is proper safety protocol for armors? Uh, not when I was on set, no. Did Ms. Gutierrez shake the dummy rounds for the cast and crew? Not when I was on set, no. If Ms. Gutierrez had shown the dummy rounds to the cast and crew, what do you think would have happened? Um, yeah, we, we object to speculation. If, if, he, if he has an opinion, if he, if, if he knows based, up, based upon his personal knowledge. In your opinion, working on this movie set with Ms. Gutierrez and working on other movie sets with other armors, if she had taken the dummies, rattled them, showed them to the cast and crew, do you think that live round would have been discovered? No. You don't? Oh, pardon me. Had we looked at all of the ammo, we would have known whether it was dummies or live. Who made the decision not to show the cast and crew the dummy rounds prior to handing the gun to anyone in the church? I would guess the armor or... Again, he's just guessing. He, he is. He all right, all right. That's his answer. He guessed, so we'll strike it. Okay. He guessed. Is it your understanding that Ms. Gutierrez loaded that gun? It, it is. Sorry, did you all hear me? Because my mic was off. Yes, you're all saying yes. Okay. <clears throat> In your opinion. Would Ms. Hutchins be alive today if Ms. Gutierrez had not put a live round in the gun? Yeah, again, I'm going to I'm going to strike that. You didn't get an answer, so. All right. Who is the person on the set of a movie who is... In charge of firearms. Asked and answered. Sustained. Do you know why your civil lawsuit doesn't include Ms. Gutierrez? You'd have to refer to my counsel for that answer. I don't know. 
have you testified today in order to further your civil lawsuit? Um, I've testified today to bring justice for the death of my friend. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Nothing further. All right, you're excused. Thank you, sir. All right, we're going to break for the for the evening. Uh, follow the bailiff directions. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Don't read anything about the production, this case. Don't look anything up. Don't do any research. Thank you. Um, where were you going to, uh, Brian, did you have them in a different location in the morning? No. Okay. okay. All right, so downstairs, 830, okay? Thank you. All rise for the jury. George, were you going to... Yes, thank you.